<laughs> All right, guys, we're back with another podcast. Hope you guys are enjoying it. And uh, we're here with Cupper's Critters all the way from Australia. So you guys get to see some really cool uh, animals from over there. Make sure you stay tuned for this one. Okay, Chris, man, Hold just on, uh, lay it on us. Um, nobody knows who the fuck you are. So, um, you know, let's hear about the beginning and let's hear about what you're doing now. Yeah, of course. Look, um, I think I've been keeping reptiles since I was about 12. So um, initially, you know, just the usual stuff that we go through over in Australia, which is, you know, your blue tongues, um, bearded dragons, all that sort of jazz. So I think I got to about 18, lived in my own house and just, you know, done, done the transition between, uh, you know, the blue tongues, the bearded dragons, uh, whatever it is that our licensing requirements could allow us. So I pretty much just bounced between a couple of different species. It wasn't until I was about 23, I think it was, that I decided to, to uh, focus on one thing, which was the Nefuris geckos. Um, we obviously have an ability to uh, get the wild catches from WA to bring across quite a bit of stock. So I uh, was able to, to jump on that, that, um, that train. And, and realistically, I, I think I had about 100-odd adult breeded the first geckos when you know i think they'd only realistically just hit the market probably about four to six months previous so wow. um sp spent, a, spent a fair bit of time playing with those and you know uh, the old rack system come out uh, the ability to hoard sort of come out in me and i think in the end i had about 300 odd so wow. um in any given year i think it's a couple of hundred uh, that i was punching out this is in a much smaller market than what uh, the states would have so um you know, just by necessity, I think I ended up keeping the majority of what I what I produced just because we didn't really have buyers for it. But the um, the kickoff from you know just keeping keeping animals through to you know breeding them on on I wouldn't say mass scale, but a mass scale for over here was a couple of mutations started to pop up in the first geckos. One of particular was a, a patternless uh, variety, which we we dubbed the jelly bean. Um, mm. Up until that point, there wasn't really that many. Um, I think there was three or four. Uh, there was sporadic amounts being produced. No one could really tell you the mode of inheritance. Um, so I was lucky enough to pick up a female. Uh, just to give you an idea of costings, even for us, that was about a $6,000 purchase. Um, wow. And at, at 23, I, I don't think I was really that cashed up then and had to had to redraw off a, off a uh, loan to actually buy it. And within six weeks, it had actually passed away. Oh, and up, oh, up, up until that point, I didn't, never actually had one. Um, pass away so for me it was, it was uncharted territory and of course it was the the six thousand dollar variety so um went mm -hmm. went back went back to the fold uh, another male had popped up which was preferential anyway uh purchased that and just went for gold from there and i think in the first couple of years i'd punched out nearly 100 of these jelly oh, bean wow. animals so um yeah the, the, at that point none of us had really had an albino uh we we oodled all the photos from overseas on i think gecko Geckos Unlimited and all that sort of jazz. So yeah. um, everything in my house, so I had genetic hypos, I had um, a couple of the Pilbarensis varieties with, you know, train track stripes yeah, and yeah, such. Yeah. And there, was, there was a couple of breeders working on some bits and pieces on the side, you know, outside of me, which, you know, I could mention half a dozen names that um, preceded me. But, um, you know, I was just waiting for this albino to come. And because of the, the legislation over here, we obviously can't import export. Uh, mm -hmm. And the first person usually to pop up with something different, especially if it's known to be overseas, is is someone that usually cops it. So um, I think I waited nearly two, three years for that to happen. As everything sort of transitions, you get a little bit bored with what you're doing, especially when it's year after year after year. You want a bit of a different challenge. Um, so from that point onwards, I think green tree pythons were kind of the, the elitist of our list. So uh, we've obviously got a native variety up, up north, but... Uh, preceding me, me even being interested in them. Uh, there'd obviously been smugglers bringing in uh, all kinds of stuff from Indonesia and, and the likes. So there was mm -hmm. quite a few red mixed neonates and stuff kicking around. And uh, mm -hmm. I just bought, bought half a dozen and then it really took off from there. You know, um, I think I think at that point I, I'd spent, you know, my whole uh, savings plus then some from selling off the, the Nefuris collection um, to jump into green tree pythons. And, I think the old saying is, if you're trying something new, go slow. Um, but uh, I ended up with probably that's no fun. 
Uh, of course it's no fun. Of course it's no fun. So when you, I'm one of those people that likes to do the whole balls and all thing. So I um, dropped quite a considerable amount of cash on that and got half, I think, probably about a year and a half into it and realised that I really didn't like snakes. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate them. I can keep them alive, but I just it's just not my jam. So um, sold off all of those guys. And then uh, it was around about that time that we actually met Dave. I'd sold off the collection. Uh, it coincided around the time of a, a senior family member passing away as well. So I'd uh, jumped on a plane and come over to Tinley with the guys from, uh, you know, Peter Birch and the likes. And yeah, uh, we painted Tinley, uh, Tinley red for three days. Um, <laughs> I think I actually drank your, your little banana bar drive. Oh. Years, you know, three days. <laughs> when, um, what year was that? Oh, Dave, help me out, man. It's been an absolute blur. I think it was about 10 years ago, to be honest. Yeah, I want to say it's about 10 years maybe now, or at least yeah. in the ballpark 10 years. Um, yeah, wow. I can't remember, but everyone came over. Um, it might have yeah, it had to be about 10 years ago. But no, that was a great weekend. I remember everything about that weekend. I remember most things about that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I made some look. I think it, um, it definitely opened my eyes up to, to what the hobby could be, that's for sure. You know, our hobby over here is pretty, um, pretty subdued by comparison. Um, you know, the, the fact that you guys opened, I don't know whether it's the accent or what, it's a standard Aussie thing when we come over to the States, but, you know, you opened your arms, let us pretty much run them absolute mark. I made some wicked friends and I've still got you included, the likes of Nikki from LLC and um, Jen and, um, you know, Jamie Houseman and all, all the lots. You know, I'd, I'd come over to see Rico Walder at that point, but unfortunately he was... Um, had just been diagnosed with, with brain cancer at the time. So, um, you know, at that, that point in time, you know, it's just a kid in a candy store walking, walking through those aisles. You know, there wasn't anything that was, it was restricted. Everyone had access to everything at that stage. You wanted it, you had cash. There was an ability to find it somewhere legally. It just, you know, that you had it. Um, and that, that's definitely something that's foreign to us. Um, you know, those, those auctions that at Tinley, we you're pretty much dropping, Fifty thousand dollars on something that's worth, you know, a thousand, um, just to donate to someone. You know, the, that that again was just absolutely amazing to see the fact that you know you, you guys had that support and have each other's back over there. But um, the, the animals, oh, I think I, I'd lost myself by day one. I think we'd had had about um, ten. No word of a lie, I reckon I had about ten minutes sleep in thirty eight hours. Uh, we'd gone from Australia to to LA where it was 30, 33 degrees, and then. To, to Michigan that night and I was in shorts and a singlet and it was snowing outside. Uh, and I'm just <laughs> like, man, I've had bugger all sleep. I am going to get sick for sure. Um, <laughs> but, of course, we backed it up first thing in the morning and started drinking at your equivalent of 4.30 in the morning because we couldn't sleep. And um, that was the day before Tindley and, again, didn't get really that much sleep that night. I think got about six hours and then uh, we had the next morning kid in the candy store and then that night it just kicked off. So... It's uh, good fun. Like I, I still talk about it now. I think we, um, you know, every time I speak to, to one of the guys from the states, it's it's always someone else is in the room with me, and they don't believe the stories from Tinley, and I'm having to get someone on Skype real quick to, to confirm. But um, yeah, uh, moving forward from there, when I got back from from the trip in the states, I'd because I'd seen everything you guys had. It was just like oh, it's just rekindled a bit of a bit of a, a love for me. So I went and. Um, basically filled my whole room with things with legs, you know, anything that I could get my hands on, you know, small dragons, uh, small monitors, medium-sized monitors, really just tried to find what, what it was that I wanted to keep again um, because, you know, our, our lists aren't exactly extensive, but the, the idea was that I wasn't, I hadn't had my heart set on anything. So I um, played around with those for two years, the likes of the Veritas Cordelineatus and um, Gillen's monitors and, and some really cool locality Ackies and uh, some of the smaller dragon species. I've got this really bad habit of keeping you know, niche animals that not many people want on mass, but um, you know, the, the, nest, the Western netted dragons, like I just got a whole lot of shipment stuff over from Western Australia because uh, I had a friend over there that was legally catching stuff. Um, and for us, that's our holy grail, the Western Australian animals. Um, so I played around with those for a couple of years and then really started to sort of travel down a niche, which was, you know, uh, a couple of specific um, critters. I think at that stage, what did I buy into? Uh, the smaller monitors, I kept those guys for a little while past that. 
uh, I started dabbling in birds quite considerably. I've always had a heart for birds. Um, so all, the, all of the weird mutation stuff that uh, popped up in some of the birds, just to, I guess, to recoup some cash, um, try and try and get back because the bird hobby over here is absolutely massive. Yeah, um, you guys so, yeah. are allowed to keep exotic birds, right? Exactly. Yeah, whatever. It's <laughs> it's this backwards consideration. It's, you know, we can't have exotic reptiles, but uh, any exotic bird seems to pop up unchallenged. You know, we've had... <laughs> The old Quaker parrot here, which is known to be invasive across the world, we've had that in droves. We've got mutations kicking off left, right, and centre here at the moment. Um, I've got illigas macaws. I've got mm. you know, wow. gold collar macaws, and you know I jump online, and they're, they're quite um, quite uh, they're kept in numbers over here. So you jump online to grab some data because you're like, yeah, well, the US would be breeding these things in droves for sure, and. You know, they're coming in dribs and drabs from wild caught catchments for you guys and not really many people are actually keeping them, whereas we've got, you know, 1,500 individual individuals in captivity right now across private hands. It's like, wow, we can, we can get, get away with birds, but we can't get away with, you know, having a boa or, you know, <laughs> having all that stuff. You know, we get the draconian laws slapped down on us quicker than you can say boo. Um, and I think now it's early days, it was a bit of a slap on the wrist and, first offence was like a couple of hundred dollar fine and you had to go through the whole stress of going to court and all that sort of jazz. But now, you know, they're starting to beef it up as some of the cases come through and set a precedent. So I think the, the most recent one was about $6,000 fine and a suspended wow. jail sentence for owning a couple of exotics. Um, they pretty much slap you as if you bought them in. Huh. Wow. It's wild. Yeah, how many so how many kookaburras do you keep? Kookaburras, I actually don't keep any because they... <laughs> I'm, um, I'm I hear they're in, annoying. <laughs> uh, they're not actually. We've got. I'm in a, um, a relatively rural setting um, in Victoria, which is the southern region of, of Australia. So, uh, for us, you just have to drive maybe 30, 40 minutes out of the city, and kookaburra start to sort of make an appearance. But I've got six breeding pairs on the property at the moment, and I've got boxes up for them. So I don't. I don't need to breed them. Don't need to keep them. They're a licensed bird, and once a year, occasionally, I get a. Um, a baby that's sort of dropped out of – I've only been here for a couple of years, but I think there's been two or three babies that have dropped out of the nest a bit early because the box has moved or a predator or something has tried to catch them. So give them a couple of mice for a couple of weeks and uh, get, them, get them to the point, and now they're hanging around property. So, it's, um, yeah, they're, cool. they're, like, they're like the old bin chicken around here, to be honest. Yeah. They're pretty much like pigeons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kookaburras are like the pigeons. I love they, it. they are. It's, awesome. it's, oh, it's, it's really funny. I send photos of the fifteen hundred odd galahs and corellas and cockatoos that land on my front lawn every morning, and and anyone in the states absolutely loses their mind. So yeah, they're like ten thousand dollar birds over here, and I'm like, well, you want them? Come and get them, man, because they're, they're, they're literally <laughs> ripping up my lawn, and I'm over it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's funny you were talking about like your experience coming over here and seeing all the animals at Timley and all that. And, you know, we're over here like, God damn it, why can't we get some Australian animals? Like just literally yeah. want yeah. everything you have you have in your backyard and we can't even touch that stuff. So yeah. just look, we're feeling it too a little bit. We're hurt. but um, Yeah. Yeah. Look, after speaking to a couple of people in Timley, they're like, you know, tell us about what you keep. And I'm like, well, I've got this. And they're like, whoa. And I'm like, dude, it's like 50 bucks over here. Relax. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it's 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 still quite um, painful for us. You know, we, we obviously take for granted what we have, but you know, it's still quite painful when we see the likes of um, I don't want to drop a name. You can edit it out later. But the likes of red earth, you know, with monitor species that we can't even keep over here, but are native here. Um, you know, Australian animal mutations popping up over there that we can't necessarily go. Hey, it's got no ecological value or any um, um, you know sustainability value. So why don't you just send it back to us. <laughs> yeah. We can't actually do it. Um, you know, even geographically across the states in, in Australia, you know, Victoria, we've got a pretty generous list, I will say that, just in case Parks is watching because I don't want you to clamp it down any further. But, um, you know, we've got a pretty generous list, but there's some things in there that really don't make sense. You know, if, as a as a 18, or not even, as a 16-year-old with my parents' blessing, I can keep a saltwater crocodile in Victoria. Whoa. You know, and all I needed to do was pay an additional fee to have a advanced license. Um, I can keep wow. a lapis as an 18 year old. So the most venomous snakes in the world, I can keep them as an 18 year old with no experience whatsoever, as long as my parents signed off on it. Um, that's and that's crazy. in Victoria. 
you know, I can keep mammals, which is um, a luxury like only a couple of states have. So I can have kangaroos. I've got, I literally, we can walk outside the door right now. There's probably a kangaroo in my yard. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. We can keep kangaroos. We can keep sugar gliders, you know, all the stuff that you guys probably have in, in private zoos. You know, we can keep that mm -hmm. in Victoria on license as well. Um, but for us in Victoria oh. to, you know, ask for a species that may, another state may already have, we basically go through submission phases. So every, I think every eight years or every four years, I'm not, I've never really bothered with it because it's just too too hard basket. But um, you basically, if you've got a species that you want bought on our licensing list, you need to put together a full blown SA style submission uh, and actually do the word legwork to find a hundred individual animals in captivity and name who has them, where they are, hmm. and how many, how successful they've been in breeding them, or something along those lines, and put the submission in for consideration. Not, hey, I've gone and done all this work. I've tracked down keepers who are usually pretty cagey about keeping stuff. I've tracked them down. I've got them to agree to sign off that they've got these animals across every state, and then I've submitted it. Okay, we'll think about, um, <laughs> you know, and that that's essentially what we have to go through in Victoria. Now, to give you an idea, our list. Uh, the likes of Queensland. Queensland's got a rule that if you can legally obtain it, generally they put it on. Uh, so if you've got someone in some of the other states that has an animal that's not necessarily got a species code in Queensland, um, you come to them with the, the evidence that there's someone that's got a licence that's got this thing and they'll, they'll make a species code for you. It's the same as New South Wales. Uh, the caveat on that is Queensland currently is going through uh, regulation uh, changes at the moment, so I think they're trying to clamp down on that. Uh, New South Wales, same situation. You can find it legally. You're allowed to keep it. Uh, South Australia is probably the most progressive of every every state, and, that, and we'll get into the reason why that is a little bit later. But um, the owner of iPets, which is where I got the enclosures from, uh, he's on a committee. Uh, a couple of key keepers are on committees that, that meet with the parks and regulations regularly, and they've got a really proactive um, uh, relationship going on that, that allows them to do that sort of stuff. And they've got a rule as well. If you can legally find it, we'll put it on. And they've also got a rule that if you've only got one reptile, you don't need a license. They've got a whole example, it's just like Victoria. Um, WA is draconian. You know, they've got a list of maybe five or six species that are allowed. I shouldn't say five or six. I think it's about 15 or 20. But they can only keep things that are found in their state. And it's only a very restricted list. They can't keep every single animal that's found in their state. So. Um, they can't bring anything over from the East Coast across for biosecurity reasons. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Tasmania can only have uh, things that are found in Tasmania from memory, which is only a couple of couple of reptiles. It's so cold. Um, it's it's just a it's a weird it's a weird place. You know, when we're seeing the likes of you know Asia generally is is whatever you want to do, you do. You want a giraffe in your front yard, we'll go get it for you. Um, mm. But you know, we see the, the Asians and then we see the Americas, you know, we see the fact that you can keep whatever the hell you want. We see that there's reptile keepers that are a full-time, this is my job type situations. And we're all sitting back mm -hmm. going, you know, that could also be us as well if the government just just said to itself, hey, there's worse things that could happen here. Why don't we just charge a tax, charge a license to actually breed and export and import? You know, it's they're just not open to it whatsoever. So... Uh, luckily, excuse me. <clears throat> luckily enough, um, in Victoria, blue tongues um, uh, don't need a license. So as long as as long as they're not Western blue tongues or Central blue tongues or shinglebacks, we actually don't need licenses for them. So um, in the last couple of months, I've actually been transitioning away from all of your licensed animals just by you know. Um, my pure interest at the moment is, is blue tongues and I don't think it's going to go any, anywhere given the fact that I've just spent absolute fortune building this room and buying the enclosures. But, um, <laughs> you know, just by pure chance, I'm actually going to down the licence because I probably won't need it um, and just focus on the, the blue tongues which are on licence. So it's not really something I need to battle with at the moment. That, that, that drive has purely come off the back of um, obviously the interest but also the fact that I can't get some of the cutting edge stuff that Queensland's got, New South Wales got. So my interest has kind of waned in the stuff that we can keep in Victoria. Hmm. It's, yeah, I was just going to say, it's funny because in a lot of our states here, you can't keep the animals that are in your state that naturally happen in your state, which is funny. 
that you guys yeah. can only keep them. So. Well, look, I think the rules, if you look at the, the keeping list, you can understand some of the bits and pieces that come through. So, you know, I think in Queensland, you can't keep crocodiles at all unless you've got a demonstrator's licence, which you're going out to schools and you, you might have a baby fresh in your hand and you're going, kids, this is a croc. Um, but, and that, that's understandable because, you know, you go like a couple hours north and they're naturally in waterways. So you can only imagine when someone gets sick of a saltwater crocodile that's got to six metres, they're like, hey, Fluffy, down into the local lake you go. And, you know, half a dozen kids go missing during the first summer and you know, <laughs> a reptile keeper is blamed for that, you know. So we totally understand that. But, you know, some of the, some of the, the animals that we can't keep in Victoria that have been, you know, bred on mass in every other state. It's just crazy. You know, it's, a, it's wheel or eye geckos that, you know, 10 years, 10 or 11 years ago when I had geckos, um, they were re really just kind of starting to hit New South Wales and Queensland. And we're fast forwarding 11 years and we still don't have wheel or eye in Victoria. Um, and these things have, you know, they've gone through three peaks in that time, you know, of popularity and we, I think they were being given away for fifty dollars at one point, and we still can't keep them. Um, there's a half a dozen skink species that are prevalent across New South Wales, Queensland, um, not native to Victoria, so it's not a, not a poaching risk, risk. We still can't keep them. So, um, you know, I could understand. Like I think I watched your last show with the hognose and the fact that some some states don't allow you to sort of catch and keep mm -hmm. and, and, and go across state lines. So you're starting to see the trickle through of those types of laws, whereas we've been bound by them from day one. You know, if you pop up with an animal that is a bit different and, you know, it might have a dubious past because it's popped up somewhere or someone's posted a photo in in the NT with this animal and then all of a sudden it pops up in a private collection, you know, that that's, that's hell to pay for us. You know, that, that's parks coming, knocking down your doors, um, you know, taking a full transaction list because we've got actual record books that we need to keep up to date, taking a full mm -hmm. transaction list and then going and visiting every single person you've dealt with for the last two years just on the odd chance you've done something wrong. So, wow. um, you know, each pa paperwork um, anomaly in Victoria. So I'll, I'll send you guys a copy to, to put up um, uh, throughout the chat. But that particular um, paperwork, each one has a, has a line item. And if, for example, you forget to put a date in or you forget to or you scrub something out because you're a bit messy or your handwriting's messy, um, you know, you'll get fined for that. That's, you know, up, upwards of the extent of, I think, 100 credit items or um, fine points per offence. And that, those fine points, at max penalty, it could be $300 per paperwork issue. You know, for the general punter that, you know, wow. may, may not, I'm corporately employed. So for me, I understand that the needs of paperwork and I'm quite meticulous with it. But, you know, if you've got, a, you know, you've just had a child, you know, your animals are breeding left, right, and centre, um, you were never really given training on what to do with this type of paperwork and logging anyway. So, you know, you don't have to deal with it day to day at your job. You get a bit busy, they come and knock on your door, they give you a call, they come, and you get absolutely murdered for your record books. You know, it's, um, it's, it's quite daunting, you know, and if anything, it's probably stagnating the growth in our hobby because, you know, people, uh, A, probably 90% of the population are really just a one bit of dragon or, you know, a half dozen different animal type type um, hobbyists. But then the larger hobbyists are really, uh, it probably doesn't help that a couple of them have been done for smuggling and such, but, you know, some of the larger, larger keepers, you know, larger numbers keepers, we're the first point of call when something, something goes down in, you know, regardless of who it is. We are yeah. the first one to call for reference points, so they've got contacts in our books and stuff like that. So it's look, it, it's in some ways we're blessed to have this this uh, biodiversity in our country, but can we tap into it? No. Um, wow. Do we do we get absolutely slapped to the eleventh of the law every time this happens? Without a doubt, without a doubt. And you know the the fact that they're still clearing hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, or hectares, I should even say. Um, year after year for development and, you know, we've just improved an Adani coal mine in Queensland and all that sort of stuff. Me personally, I take personal umbrage to that purely for the fact that some of the animals that are found on that land, I can't keep. I can't keep. You know, I live here, I pay taxes, um, you know, I contribute to society. I'm, I'm employed and have been since I'm 19, you know. It, it really burns me when I can't keep something. I, I've got a, uh, you know, a passion or a drive to keep. 
um, you know, it's not like, you know, I don't understand that a couple of people have done the wrong thing, but it's not like we're going to pull or lift every single animal that we come across in the bush and putting it on a truck and sending it overseas, you know. It's, it's mm. just a handful of people doing the wrong thing that is sort of shutting down any, any proactive conversation to get the rules changed. But, um, look, I think that that is changing, though. You know, I think we're all starting to sort of liven up that using South Australia as a, a really good example their proactive relationship with parks has, has definitely showed some headway. Um, I was, it was a very brief chat that I had with the owner of iPets and URS, or previously URS. Um, and just some of the positivities that are coming out of that committee meeting is just, uh, it's massive. You know, I don't think any of the other states are really that progressive. And I just hope it's catchy, you know, because Victoria is known as the nanny state. And, you know, I, I can't wait to keep some of that those animals that we've not been able to get our hands on for years. So um, <clears throat> in Australia, like, you know, you came to America and you saw the auction that we had, and that's for the U.S. ARC, um, you know, yep. they're there to help defend our rights, try to keep things in order, try not to let things get taken away. Um, do you guys have anything in Australia like that where there's a team of people that are working for everyone else's rights with the government? Look, I think there's, um, because we're so segmented by state and it's, it's, I can't tell you these, I can't even begin to tell you the differences between states and regards to governments um, because some of the laws just, they just don't make sense realistically. I don't think there's a national body. I think um, a close friend of mine by the name of Troy Kay, who owns K Brothers or was previously K Brothers Pythons, mm -hmm. um, he tried quite steadily with, you know, he had a big heart and he just really wanted the hobby to grow and, and pushed with that. But, um, you know, I don't think it really gets anywhere because our government structure is, you know, you've got the local government. You can be best mates with the local government. You can have great segue, but you really need a politician that, that wants this to be their, their case study, you know. Um, and if you don't find someone that's able to back that or the right person to back that, the, the conversations really don't go much further. You know, for them, they don't want us yeah. to have those rights. They don't want us to have an open keeping list. And I know the Queensland team at the moment, or the Queensland guys, they've got a um, a regular, you know, just a private regulatory type situation going on where there's a group of people that are approaching and going to these conversations to make sure our rights are heard. But even then, you know, the, the correspondence backwards and forwards from these types of meetings is is patchy at best. And the recommendations that we're putting forward to, to challenge some of the stuff that doesn't make sense on their end, I think a lot of that gets lost or they're just non-contactable for a period of time and then oh by the way we've hit the hit the uh the date limit and that's what we've decided on so um and that, that's i think that's been the commonality across all the states so no in short we don't have an ozark or, or anything similar to that you know it's it needs to happen but it's also finding the right people to front it because um generally the, the people in the past that have fronted those types of ideas have had either vested interest um, with some of their extracurricular activities on the side or, um, you know, have been quite questionable characters within the hobby to begin with, which isn't really the right step forward. Hmm. Well, um, um, oh, go ahead, Ben. You got something? No, go sure. Wait, is that a I, show, I, was just, I was just going to say, um, like, from the outside looking in, I, I never realised that inside of Australia it was so strict for you guys. Like, I know you couldn't get anything new in, but I didn't realise – as an Australian citizen, you can't keep certain things and everything's really like sort of tightly regulated like that. I figured like in, intra country, you guys could probably do whatever you felt like. You just couldn't send and receive stuff overseas. So that's really eye opening. Well, even even with the unlicensed species, you know, like a blue tongue, you know, it's, I like to put this as a, a when I'm talking to friends about um, the licensing requirements and stuff and the import export permits that we need to fill in to tell parks that we're sending an animal from Victoria to Queensland because we've sold it or things like that. Um, the idea is that if I was a junior keeper, I'd never kept anything else in my life in Victoria bar blue tongues. Uh, I never need a license. I didn't know what a license was. I didn't know what a record book was. I didn't know what an import permit was. And I decided to breed a litter. And as you do when you're young, you breed a litter, you get excited, you sell them, it's made a bit of pocket money, you expand. I then start sending them interstate. Never in my life have I had to do that with a licensed animal before. So as far as I'm concerned, it's just like having any normal pet, dog, cat, bird. I put it on, I book a plane, I put it in the relevant container and I send it to the new, new party. We actually have to, even though I've never had access to that before, 
I need to know that I need to fill out an import permit for that. Hmm. So, you know, these are the types of things that sort of start to pop up. And if I hadn't have sent it with an import permit, though, I would get fined and I would be crucified through the law if, if for whatever reason they decided to come and inspect or, you know, the person on the other end was a bit of a bit of a sketchy character and, you know, landed on their radar and you know, they've got transactions between us. So, you know, it's, it is quite quite regulated here and you know all i can say is those you know i know the lacy acts have come through from your end and there's been a couple of bits and pieces that have been won uh, a couple of bits and pieces that have been restricted on your end but all i can say for every one law you've got we've got about 30 and you know we 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 look at you guys as a as the pinnacle of what we could be but you know you guys are still complaining it's not good enough but we'd be we'd be wrapped to have it we'd be absolutely wrapped yeah. yeah. Well, it's just, it's not fair, man. Like, we should be able to keep Australian stuff too. Like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> we only have 98% of the rest of the world we have access to. Is... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, you know, whatever you dream, you can have. Um, but look, I, I think with recent, recently, we've been um, sort of trickled down. And I, I think it's just because we've all been reading. We read the American stuff for genetics and we, we follow you guys closely because we all dream one day that we'll have 500 ball pythons in our room. But um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a ball python person, just FYI. Um, <laughs> I should but, hope you know, not. <laughs> <laughs> look, we, we all dream about having those animals, but we also know that anything that's Australia at the moment that pops up on your end, you'll you'll get similarly slapped by your authorities. So it's um, it's interesting that our level of uh, red tape has now sort of hit your your shores as well. Yeah, a bit. Yeah. I, want, oh, I just yeah. want land mullets. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, if you've ever actually been out to the natural habitat and been nailed by one, trust me, you don't want one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll take the tip of your finger off and not even think think uh, think twice about taking another one. Wow. So um, this is an old school story um, out of Australia, and I don't know how true it is, but the original albino carpet python, um, I heard of course, this, was, story. this is way back. So for, and I could be completely wrong. Hopefully you know the story, but I, I was under the impression. Well. Uh, do you want to tell the story? Because I thought it was a fairly interesting one, but I just don't know at the end of the story, did I hear the original animal actually eventually did make its way back into Australia? So... The okay, I want you to tell me your story because there seems to be a, a the end end story of this seems to be completely different to what's actually uh, happened. So go for it. <laughs> like the whole story, and again, you know, we don't have to get into a lot of details because I'd rather hear it from your end because my end's probably just a fib. But um, I believe I heard it was at one point at a zoo in Australia. I was under the impression it was at a zoo, then it disappeared. Um, ended up in the European market. Europeans worked with that for a very long time. And then I heard the end of the story was the actual original animal was returned at one point. Okay, again, so that's albino carpet python? Yes. Okay, so the, the story behind the albino carpet python is actually this. So we've obviously got a series of snake catchers across Australia. Um, they get call-outs from various different uh, parties. We'd obviously hope that people don't take to them with shovels, but, you know, I think 50% of call-outs end up with a shovel through the back of the snake. So... Um, these call out people's rush to the scene to, to, to try and, um, you know, get things sorted. The Blondie, the original um, carpet python, albino carpet python, was at a caravan park in NT, if my story is correct. Uh, a lady called a snake catcher, snake catcher arrived. Snake catcher then, I don't know the, the, the in-betweens of this, but then was approached by a zoo or left it at a zoo or um, NT Wildlife Park or something got it. Um, they, they were then approached by Doc Rock or um, Southern Cross Reptiles, who's quite renowned back in the day here, um, was approached to breed that animal and then return animals back to them. You know, so the original had to go back to them plus some progeny. Um, and he obviously painted it as an idea of, you know, these things are you know, worth an absolute ton. This is the first real mutation or the, that's really popped up in carpet pythons. So... I think the original ones went for 25, 50 grand because I'm not a snake person. I'm not realistically wow. able to give you the full detail, but it was an absorbent amount for anybody, you know. Um, and given the fact that it was the pinnacle animal at the time, plus it was uh, the first of something new, um, you know, I, 
I think there would have been back end deals as well. But I think the original arrangement was he bred it, bred Blondie, which was happened to be female, made some progeny, made a whole lot more for himself, obviously hets and all that sort of jazz. Um, turned that into a business, business venture and then returned, I think, either Blondie or the progeny, I can't remember, back to NT Wildlife Park. Um, but at two years old, they were tiny still, like they'd been trickle fed. Um, meanwhile, you know, he's basically made an empire on the albino carpets. But um, look, I don't think they actually went to Europe and back. Um, did they make their way to Europe? It wouldn't surprise me given the, the happenings of the last probably four to five years with a couple of smuggling smuggling cases that have popped up. Um, but, yeah, look, I don't think they went to Europe and then made their way back, that's for sure. I think it was the other way around. They had gotten to a $500 or a $1,000 bottom-out price here and uh, smugglers seen an opportunity to send them across the world for stupid amounts of money and bring negative uh, attention back to us. So... Um... In the United States, the animal that really set off breeding was the albino Burmese. And actually, just before I came on here, I saw Bob Clark make a post saying that 34 years ago to the day is when they hatched out the first one in captivity here. Um, wow. Was the albino carpet kind of that initial animal in Australia that kind of opened up everyone's eyes to possibly breeding reptiles and mutations, or was there something else? Um, look, I realistically, I think it was that because before that it was, you know, we had a, even during this, it was purists. It's like, okay, it's pure Darwin. It can only be put to a Darwin, you know, and that, that um, mentality really continued for a good 10 years post that. We didn't have JAGs. We didn't have um, any of the stuff that was being worked on overseas. And, you know, I think growing tree pythons was the only thing that really got, um, uh, I wouldn't say abused, but... Um, the, the, the idea that we could keep them uh, became a manipulation of the licensing system and that's when all the Indonesian stuff started coming through. But um, at that point, I think, yeah, definitely, I think the, the albino carpet was the, the catalyst for the morph market to kick off because we'd, we'd had a lot of, probably a lot of um, other genes sitting there that no one really understood that that's what they had. Um, fast forward 10 years and all of a sudden we've got naturally occurring stuff like, you know, the, the, the Xanthix being worked on, um, you know, the likes of the K brothers and, you know, the, uh, all of the carpet breeders, you know, Doc Rock at that point had, had bought jag and like there'd been jags in the market at some point and he actually started marketing them as what we call RPMs. So I think there's various other chats that have been had in probably the last couple of weeks about that as we start to, to boot up mm. some of these um, online chats and stuff. But um, you know, the Jags really hit and then Jags sort of worked their way through a hypo um, and then we, we'd identified that we'd had a hypo or a caramel. Uh, then we had Xanthix and then it, it really just boomed from there. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I think the, the likes of the Albino Blue Tongues had sort of started to, to pop up as well. A place by the name of Snake Ranch seemed to have obviously been called out to an animal that had popped up. Uh, and they bred them. Uh, Melanistics had started to sort of make make an appearance around that time as well. And they're, they're the sort of catalyst that really kicked us in the direction of, of starting mutations. Um, and fast forward 15, 20 years, and we've made a considerable amount of progress across various different animals. You know, I think uh, a lot of the animals that don't have mutations attached to them have dropped in value. Um, I think they'll do, do their cycles. But realistically, if there's no mutation value, or it's not a particular wild type that's unique or a particular colour point. It's not really holding its value at the moment. Um, but, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I know that um, black-headed pythons uh, or womers, the albino versions of those, um, there's photos surfacing. You know, they, they look dated. They look very dated. Um, it could have been 20 or 30 years ago, the old Polaroid or something similar with a bit of a date timestamp on the bottom of them those photos have been around for quite a long time. And the fact that we still don't have anyone coming to the table with those types of animals in their hand going, hey, I'm working on these, yet there's albino, Pyth albino black-headed pythons in Europe. It, it's quite strange to me. You know, it's a foreign concept. If you've got it and it's, it's been legally or it's popped up um, from your line breeding, I'd be surprised given the modern age that people aren't out there promoting they've got it. Yeah, um, you're right. I mean, I think for the first time in a very long time, we saw the albino um, blackheads pop up in Europe this year. And like you said, 15, 20 years ago, there was pictures of them and they just kind of everyone stopped talking about it. And now we have them again. But, you know, I do always find it funny when something from Australia mutation wise pops up somewhere else. It's like, you know, like you said, what are the chances? 
Yeah. Um, well, yeah, the K Brothers, yeah, that was an awesome company. Uh, I believe they're not um, doing Blackhead Pythons, or they're not even a company anymore. No, no, no. So they're, they're, he's basically, well, like, I don't know which way it, it come around, but it's just like every sort of reptile uh, event, you sort of gravitate towards the people that are your people. And um, Troy and uh, his brother Denver uh, back in the day were very much open about me sort of um, spilling the beans about my geckos and lots of the stuff from the magazine because they own scales and tails as well. And then the subsequent expos sort of kicked off from there. So Troy um, Troy was doing the carpet python mutations and, and spent you know, a good decade of his life dedicated to that. Unfortunately, Troy's uh, also very, very sick. So he's got um, renal failure. Um, he's had a couple of donor kidneys, had cancer over the last couple of years as well. So um as part of the, the the treatment, he actually has a port in his arm, so he had to down all of his snake projects uh, because one wrap around his arm uh, would actually pop that port and cause a bleed out. So for him, he's um, he's had to down pretty much everything he loves to to focus on his health and his family. So um, absolutely love them; they're, they're pretty much family to me. Um, but yeah, his his brain for what he, I think he calls himself a, a Queensland redneck. You know, his brain for mutations and colours and just identifying, um, you know, something weird in a snake that's popped up and seeing potential in it and then actually reproducing it or, or doing something with it is out of this world. Like, I've, if you sit there and talk to him, he's just, he's just wealth of knowledge. You know, you could show him one thing and he'd be like, yep, yeah, if I get that and I whack it with this in five generations, I'll have something different. So... But no, he, he doesn't do any of the snakes anymore. A lot of the black-headed projects were Denver's. Uh, towards the end, uh, Troy was breeding those and playing with those. Um, but yeah, it, with his health failing and, and all the other things that were going on in his life, he had to down majority of it. I think we've all done that at some point, dropped a, a couple of projects that we probably shouldn't have. But um, there's there's plenty of, plenty of um, other keepers here that are sort of continuing to work with some of the pinnacle animals he's got. Um, I actually bought in to a couple of the, the black headers as he was downing them just because I thought I'd give snake keeping a dabble again. But again, the old Chris, you don't like snakes sort of reared, reared its head after eight months and I passed them off to someone that I knew that would do good with them. <laughs> nice. Do you guys want to start talking blue tongue skinks a little bit? Yeah, oh, should we just do it? <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. So you guys, um, so you made some really great pandanus eastern stuff. Um, really beautiful animals. Um, you yeah. recently just got some new animals in from Joe too, from the uh, what was it, white tea positive albinos? Yeah. So I've got a fair bit here. I actually didn't make those um, single factor pandanus stuff. So um, a couple of years back, I jumped into these thinking I was just going to get a couple of pets. Um, I hadn't had animals for about six years. I'd had a couple of the, the macaws that were sitting here that were taking up my time and keeping me happy. Um, so I jumped into a couple of pets and, you know, the, given the fact that Joe and I had had history in the past, we kind of, while I was doing geckos, he was starting off with the blueies and really making a name for himself. Um, I went to obviously Joe, because you don't go to anybody else. And I said, Joe, I need a couple of weird, weird things. Can you shoot me down something? I don't really want to breed. Uh, he kind of chuckled at me and said, yeah, like, like shit, you're not going to breed, but um, <laughs> send me, send me some ripper animals. Um, and I obviously did the, the old cupper job of feeding the crap out of them, probably overfeeding them like I do everything around this house um, and got them up to breeding size. And, and first year I, I punched out three litters, um, which was, you know, your white snows, albinos, anaries, like all the stuff you guys drool over over, over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, at that stage as well, I just moved house. So um, just moved into this place, didn't have the room set up, didn't have insulation. It was on the tail end of winter. So they really got a very mild um, transition into to spring and summer. So I did really well that year. Um, but then the following year was the first year here with a full winter. And I because I had not been here in a full winter, I wasn't completely across what I needed to do to keep the room warm. And I, I basically just stuffed up their cycling. So this year, I actually, after coming off the back of a 40 baby year, um, I bred a single baby. Nice. Uh, which is, <laughs> in hindsight, I look at the positives because the, the kid has kind of just hit 12 to 14 months at the time. And, you know, he's, he's wanting dad more and, 
Um, plus my job, I'm probably about two hours away from where I actually work. Um, so oh, traveling in and out. Oh, man. Plus, plus all the other stuff that comes with life and keeping a zoo, um, plus the other half and all that sort of jazz. It was just, okay, in hindsight, it's probably the best thing that could have happened last year. But uh, from a reptile keeper's perspective, I've cursed the reptile gods for the last 12 months and, and <laughs> wanted to throw every skink outside to live its life outside. But um, so, yeah, look, um, I actually bred one animal this year. Um, I'll put my hand up and admit that. Uh, all of the stuff that I've got this year has just been buying. So those single factor patternless, I think that's our first real co-dominant trait that's popped up in blue tongues over here. Um, so yeah, I, I bought a couple of in of those with the hope of doing something for next year and all this coming year. Um, and T plus has been, you know, ripper for Joe. You know, Joe's been absolutely pummeling that project for the last four to five years. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm not just going to get a T plus, I'll get a T plus White Northern, just the next step. There you so go. That's, been, that's been an absolute ripper animal. Uh, he's, he's turned into the fav, favorite sure animal. Of the um, I've also got in this year a snow that's 100% het White Northern. So it's already an anery albino. Uh, it's 100% het White Northern and it's also 66% melodistic. So that, that's going to be an absolutely powerhouse animal moving forward. Um, I always like to make things difficult for myself, but so, so far um, I've kind of hit the odds with everything that Joe sent, Joe sent down. So um, I, have to, I have to hug that guy next time I see him because he's been absolutely, <laughs> absolutely brilliant to me over the last couple of years. Um, but, yeah, look, I can get some animals out. I've, I've pretty much got all the stuff from last year as well. I've got some, some bits and pieces there, some of the uh, Kimberley mix albinos because uh, a lot of the, the mutations here have um, – have been mixed so we've got northerns and easterns so the original eastern stock has been known for being quite hard to uh work with um hit and miss with animals <laughs> a little bit flimsy um so joe along the lines have actually crossed them into a kimberly albino or kimberly northern strain so uh that that has just absolutely done wonders for those and that, i think that that stage when um joe had done the old eastern northern cross with some of the mutations that were popping up um is really when all the mutation breeding started to kick off. Um, if you hadn't have done that, we'd still be, you know, really limited success with what we do. And um, yeah, it's, I can't speak highly enough if you can't tell him, Joe, with some yeah. of the bits of pieces he's done. But um, all I can say is that, you know, his next next push of the envelope is going to be, you know, 10 times better than what we've already got. So I just hope, hope he just keeps working with what he's doing. So I've got new stuff to play with. But um, I'll go grab some animals. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, he's gone. <laughs> I think maybe he has a fan he turned on. I was going to ask about that. It sounded like a Zamboni in the background, maybe. But I don't think they have hockey there, so probably not the case. <laughs> maybe um, it started raining. I, it kind of sounded like torrential <laughs> downpour. Yeah, we, we can ask him about that. There's, there's something going on over there. Yeah, I'm really interested in his setup, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh, are we going to cut this part out? <laughs> we can. We don't have to. Yeah. Did he walk off on the one side and come back on the other side? Going <laughs> for usually like you know sixty, so he probably went that way. And then... Yeah, we'll have to rewatch that. I'm a little confused. <laughs> we live in a three D world. <laughs> so I'll start off with the um, singular baby that I produced this year because he's he's well, I should say she. Is not quite um, small or what you would call. Oh man! Yeah. I am going to. I would love to have a season where I just had that one baby. <laughs> <laughs> Holy I'll, uh, cow! I'll show you guys some photos of you know the year before the first baby that come out of this particular anery female was um, you know an albino and. The subsequent year, the first, the only baby that she pumped out was another albino. So I've got pretty much back to back year on year photos of her sitting there with one albino baby next to her. Um, and when I put it up, everyone's like, "Oh, you're regurgitating photos, Chris." I'm like, "No, that's pretty much what's happened year on year again." Um, but look, yeah, I'm look. If, it could have been much worse. I could have produced a bloody possible het out of the same female, you know, and be stuck with one possible het for the year. So. Um, this one's been dubbed Lucky. That's that's pretty much my son's lizard now. 
Um, you know, he's watching me grow this thing and he's growing with it. But, um, yeah, hopefully, with luck, I'll try and put some melodistic into her this year or maybe even the striped things that we've got, which I'll, I'll mm-hmm. grab out for a sec. Hey, cool. um, do you happen to have a fan turned on over there? No, we've just had torrential rain. The winner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so apologies because I'm in a – well, it's essentially a converted tin shed and we've insulated to the nines. Um, if I look out the window, honestly, I can't even see out the window the rain's that heavy, so – uh, apologies. Makes sense. Yeah, all good. <laughs> Can we recap what the pairing was for that last one? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that last one, I might actually grab the mother because it's a, another color variant that I'll, I'll show for you. But um, it was a double het Anne-Marie Albino uh, across a Anne-Marie visual female that was 100% het Albino. And is it so, is it safe to say that in Australia, when you're dealing with Eastern morphs, almost all of them have been outcrossed the Northerns? I wouldn't say all of them. I think there's still a considerable amount of people that are, are working with, um, with Pure Easterns. Um, okay. Of the, the striped um, head exanthic stuff here that I've got is uh, still Pure Eastern. Uh, not okay. Really Pure Eastern Albino here as well, which is a, more of a caramel type colour. Um, so, look, there are still people that are, let's call it purists. Um, right on. But you will find that, you know, I think Joe sways more to the higher percentage Northerns. Um it could be a geographic thing. It could be, you know, I'm, I'm working with the stuff that Joe's working with and so far I've been pretty successful, um, but it's not always the case. A lot of people like to keep stuff outside just to save on power. Mm. Uh, so for, for that case, you probably wouldn't want to keep a northern in Victoria. It'll freeze, freeze its proverbials off the first year, probably not even make its way through winter. So, mm. yeah. Um, moving on to the next one is pretty much my holy grail at the moment of the one that I absolutely love. So... I do that, mate. Um, which is the T plus white northern. Uh, it's coming oh, into sheds. So it's a little bit, a little bit subdued at the moment. But that, um, if you jump on my page, some of the photos there will probably show you more of the color coming through. White northern in itself takes, you know, a little bit bigger than this to to start to fade out to complete white or bone white. So I'm really hoping that these these bars don't leave because if this was a, a white northern, it would sort of be that grubby gray color. And then as it sheds out, it would turn more of the white color. So um, this fella here with luck, I should be able to get up to breeding size over the next month. Um, he's absolutely powering food and hopefully we can use him next year for some couple of projects. What do you feed them? Um, for me, I actually make up half human grade food. So I'll do a maybe a 50-50 mix between um, beef pet mints or chicken pet mints. Um, calcium powder, multivitamins, um, and then I'll use uh, a vegetable mix, like a frozen vegetable mix mulched up, and I'll make big batches of that. So I might whack some eggs in there one one time that I make it, or I might whack um, some turkey mince, or I might just, I just try and mix it up as much as possible. But the foundation is realistically a meat product uh, with some vegetable matter, and I just dose the crap out of it with, with the likes of calciums and, and multivitamins to make sure that I, anything that I'm – missing just purely on I'm, I'm one of those um i like to call myself a lazy keeper i make sure i've got uv i make sure that i'm taking out all of the the single centile things that could go wrong if i've just got them in a rack or um you know if i'm just feeding them one item you've obviously got to make sure your supplementation is better um, i just make sure that there's minimal uh, room for error which is making sure that the the food is on point making sure the lighting's on point uh, making sure the heating schedule is on point and not leaving anything to, you know, error. You know, if I'm away for three days with work, the other half, all she needs to come in here is make sure everything's alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of known for going overboard with with setups um, because I'm, I'm a little less hands-on than what I used to be. But, um, yeah, I just much rather it that way. So the food, mm-hmm. food is well and truly over-engineered, I'd say. And how often are you feeding them? Once a week? Um, the adults get fed probably every three days. Um, I'll just make sure it's a smaller amount every three days. Um, but it really just depends on the animal. Um, I've got a really bad problem with meat ants here. We've got about 20 or 30, welcome to Australia, but we've got 20 or 30 different species of ant. I wouldn't even say species, but we've got what seems like 20 or 30 different types of ants here. So um, the bigger ones get in through the cracks in, in anywhere uh, and they chase down the meat. And I've, I've had some um, keepers complain that they've had, you know, ants wipe out a whole pit of animals before so um, oh, wow. I think the first time i seen ants on a plate of food I, i've just started hand feeding them which is just much easier so 
So I'll put the animal in front of me. I might weigh it during that time, maybe once a week, just to see what's going on. Um, I'm a stickler for reptile, um, for the uh, note keeping and such. I'll throw some food in front of it. If it wants to eat, it eats. Um, the males probably get fed a little bit less just to try and keep them lean. But um, the idea is smaller amounts every three days during the warmer months. Um, and then as we're coming out of breeding, I might, or as we're coming out of cooling, uh, depending on how much weight they've lost, I'll probably feed them larger amounts every three days or depending on the animal once a week uh, if I'm trying to get some weight off them. And I hate to keep nailing you with like these uh, sort of beginner uh, keeper questions, but I'm curious how you guys do stuff over there. Um, do you, when you're making that homemade uh, food for them, are you like freezing it and throwing it out or are you doing it fresh every time? No, no, I'm definitely freezing it. So I'll do big batches of up to five kilos at one hit. So I think, don't ask me to do a pounds comparison. Okay. We, we only deal <laughs> with kilos and, and cocaine. So yeah, I okay. don't know, but... <laughs> think of it as a brick of cocaine. Um, no, look, between, I do about five kilos in one hit. So the reason I do that is, I'm, again, I'm corporately employed. I'm pretty time poor as it is. So when I do have you know 40 minutes to myself to make this food, I don't want to have to do this every single week. So. Um, I just freeze it into 600 gram batches, uh, which is enough to get me through to use it over two feeding periods in a fridge um, and just defrost it the night before I need it. Nice. Hmm. We are, uh, don't throw these guys occasional bits of fruit like apples and stuff to crunch on as well. Okay. Uh, really one quick thing. So, um, you know, you're talking about your setup, you know, UV, heat bulbs, all that good stuff. And then, of course, there's other people that just do rack systems, which has been very common in the United States. But there are more people incorporating lighting in these guys. Um, in your opinion, based on talking to other breeders, do you feel the people going above and beyond with the UV and heat bulbs over the rack systems are any more successful? Or does this species seem to do as well in either condition? I think after speaking to quite a few people, I think that the success has realistically been geographic. You know, if you speak to Joe, uh, you know, some of, some of the northern mixed stuff or the mutation breeding, anyone in the southern states hasn't really done that well. Um, but, you know, it's like anything. You've got to understand your animals. You know, if you've got an animal in your care that absolutely thrives in a rack, um, you know, it's not showing any MBD signs, it's not flimsy, it's, it's healthy, um, then by all means, all power to you, keep it in a rack. But, you know, I think a lot of the rack keepers also still put their animals outside for some sun occasionally. You know, their diets are on point. They, they're in there looking at their animals week in, week out and know exactly what's wrong before the animals even sneezed, you know. So um, what a lot of people fall into the trap of doing is throwing things in a rack, treating them like a snake and feeding them once a week and then wondering why they've got a kink wondering why they've, they've got some, um, you know, they're sneezing or they've got RI. Um, it's because these aren't snakes, guys. You've still got to check in on the animal. You've still got to understand what you're looking at. You've got to understand that not every single animal is going to do well in a rack. Um, and if that's the case, then you need to set up enclosures. Um, we're finding that, a lot, well, I'm finding personally that a lot of the southern state keepers are starting to really convert to, to um, enclosures. Um, and that could be for a multitude of reasons. It could be the fact that they're reducing the number of animals, so now space isn't at a premium. Um, it could be the fact that they've had really bad success rates with whatever they're working with year after year, and they feel that maybe it is time to put some UV in there because they don't have time to get everything else in check. But, you know, I think what works for one person never necessarily works for another. Uh, I think that's the fundamental across all reptile keeping. You know, you could replicate the exact same set up that you see at a competitor or at a friend's house and not do well with it. So you've really got to work with what works for you. Yeah. I mean, I've always said the same thing. There's a lot of different ways to work or to breed a lot of different species or work with a lot of different species. And just because it works for one guy, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Yeah, correct. Right. Um, but no, I mean, that's awesome. Um, you guys, what you got? <laughs> uh, the next one is a bit of a weird animal. This one that I bought this year. <laughs> And you guys are like, they're all weird. Um, so this is a snow. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so it's a bit of a weird one because the, the, the high intensity of white and pearlescence that comes through this is, I'm not sure if it's something to do with, you know, the genetics that have been thrown into it, just, you know, uh, genes that have been thrown down by the particular animals that are not hereditary. Um, but it's 
generally with the snows, from what I've seen, you've got two options. You've got the white snow, which seems to have a bit of a hypo trait through it as well, which makes it pretty much stark white. It's not necessarily completely white, but it's it's pink um, in most cases. And you will occasionally get a bit of patterning come through in a darker pink colour. With this particular one, it seems to have taken on the traits of um, the white snows, which is pearlescent on the whites, but it's also got these yellow bar bands across it, and they're, they're quite vibrant. Um, so for, for me, I think that might have actually come through from the Maltonistic side, which this is possible head for Mal. So, um, okay. But it's an absolute awesome an animal. It's, you know, it's one of this year's babies, and it's already powering on. Yeah. So Maltonistics, when they're young, they uh... – and I don't, I mean, I don't know when, so if a het melanistic, when it's young, it kind of looks a little bit normal and it gets darker as it gets older, right? Mm -hmm. There was so a, bit of a bit of a trajectory with that. So early days when they were trying to work out the mode of inheritance, a lot of people thought they were co-dominant because the, some of the hets were, were darker. So mm -hmm. most people would be like, okay, that's just a, you know, the first stage of co-dominant. Um, that particular one is, is definitely going to be het for Mel. So when you're deal, dealing with a, you know, something that might be a het, so a possible het, and then you're putting another possible het together, and, of course, the, the founder animals were likely darker. That's, that's kind of how it's sort of tracked down to being melanistic to begin with. People were putting, you know, they'd get a possible het litter and they'd get some darker ones and they go, those are definitely hets because they're darker. Uh, they put them together and they wouldn't get anything, you know, mm, so... Yeah. It was probably three to four, maybe five years of that, that sort of happening before people realised they were recessive. So I think to, to answer your question, I think because of the, the nature of the animals being darker to begin with, the hets will be naturally darker. So you'll generally find that anything that's got melanistic in it or has been sort of crossed into something else will generally have that darker tone put through it. Having mm -hmm. said that, though, with Joe's melanistics, um, I don't have, have any visual melanistics here anymore because I the the... the the visual melanistics that I purchased all ended up male and weren't, weren't of any use to me. So I passed them off to get some other animals in. But um, those particular ones had red and orange sidebars that actually went all the way up to the to the back. And I think that's just an underlying hypo that seems to be going through Joe's northern lines. Oh. Um, so it, the, the good part of that is that, you know, the, the pure eastern uh, melanistics were pitch black absolutely stark black. They might have some red on their belly or maybe some very small red sidebars. Um, there's a bit of variation there. But I think now that they've sort of been moved into the northern space, um, they're starting to become a bit lighter. That underlying hypo, because there's been a, a multitude of things mixed into them, has given us another colour pal palette to look at. So I think there's some photos of some of those animals that I had on my page, and they're definitely not your stock standard Eastern Melanistics. They're just... I actually cried when I had to sell those things because they were no use to me, but just purely because they, there was just, you know, bright oranges, orange flecks and red and um, some yellows sort of popping through as um, scale highlights. That's so um, when you say no use to you, um, bringing up a subject might be sensitive. I don't know about over there, but um, so I've been hearing a lot recently that um, melanistic males make horrible breeders. Um, is there any truth behind that? Is that what got you away from your males or just you needed female for a future project? At the time, I dropped uh, close to $10,000 into those particular animals because they were melanistic. They were possible het four ways for, for a multitude of other things, white northern, anery, albino. And that was pretty much the, the, the new fold or the next fold that I needed to, to unwrap to actually move forward with the projects. Now, all... I think I bought in four four animals that were of similar genetics and all four turned out to be male. Mm. So uh, by no fault, unfortunately, we do have a high percentage of males sort of popping up. I'm not sure if you have that over your end. But, um, you know, for, for us, for me personally, the visual melanistics with the projects that I had to work them into for the year, that was basically 10 grand sitting there that I could move into something else. Um, and I would spent a considerable amount of time raising these things over – six to seven months to prepare them for moving forward. And I thought to myself, you know what, we'll keep one male and we'll move forward from there. But then with the next stuff that come out the following season from Joe, it just made sense to move those animals on and put that money back into, you know, what I've just showed you, um, plus a couple of the other bits and pieces that were sort of coming out. Because, you know, realistically, can I make those again? Yes, I can. Can I get that 10 grand back when those start to decline in price? 
probably not. So it was more of a, a financial decision, I guess, uh, over a, over the heart, which occasionally you've got to make when you're sort of 50-50 on sort of a project run and, you know, keeping them because you love them. So you did a really good job of dancing around that because <clears throat> you didn't answer. <laughs> so <laughs> you didn't answer the question. Um <laughs> We have, at work, so, you know, um, <laughs> we, uh, we have a, a uh, Melanistic Eastern that's um, a straight Eastern. And uh, when we first got it, we, we bought a male. You know, the guy that we bought it from said it's a male for sure. We get it. It took a little while. We bred it. It didn't breed, didn't breed, didn't breed. And then all of a sudden, we put a male in with it, and it bred. The male locked with the – and it turned out that that was a female. So it was yeah. like, oh, awesome. That's great. We have a female. And then we find that a lot of people here in the States anyway have a lot of trouble uh, with their melanistic Easterns. And so a lot of people, there's not. Well, not a lot, but not running a people that, right. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> there's a thousand keepers over there with melanistics. And if yeah, there are, no. questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, um, not a thousand, but we had, I, I called somebody over in Australia and he said, it's like one in eight maybe that are, that yeah, I, wouldn't have to breathe. I haven't really had that um, much to do with melanistic. So when I first jumped on, I'd obviously just checked what Joe had when I first bought into these things. So for me, I just wanted some animals that were trouble free. I think Joe deep down knew that I was going to breed with these at some point. So um, he put some, some of the best stuff that he had together for me and shipped it down. And, you know, melanistic was never really on my list. I might've got one just as a pet in the future, but I also have a very close friend down in Victoria that has them. And I've kept a couple and just by way of sexing or, you know, project odds, I've not kept the four animals that I've bought in Melanistic. So, but you are right. You are right. There have been people that have, have, have said in the old school uh, position, maybe five, six years ago, that some of those Melanistic males were a little bit tragic. But, you know, I think that comes down to Pure Eastern stuff. You know, a lot of people... You know, you bring up Pure East and they're like, oh, damn it, Pure East and that's going to be a bit, bit longer to grow up and it's going to be a bit more of a pain in the ass. But, you know, I've, I also see similar things with people with the melanistic males and actually doing well. You know, I, I think it really comes down to making sure the animal is heated up. The animal is basically in tune with what you're trying to do. So they've been cycled correctly. Um, the male shed its plugs. It's done its thing. Uh, and it needs to be of age. You know, I, I don't think you can rush, uh, and this is what a lot of people don't realise, is just because one animal will breed at seven or eight months uh, from a male perspective doesn't necessarily mean every single male is going to pop out and breed at seven or eight months. You know, you've just spent the last seven or eight months pummeling it with food. It may not be developmentally ready. Um, so, you know, the, the only thing I'll say is maybe heat. You know, maybe heat them up to you know, 40 degrees or something, give them a 42 to, 42 to 45 degree and you can, guys can do the do the uh, conversion there from Celsius to Fahrenheit, but um, give them a really decent hotspot, get them revved up, give them another male to, to just really get get themselves pumped up about it and just throw it in with a female. And if the female's ready and the male is, is revved up like that, then it, it will do the job. Um, you know, I've got an anary female here. Like I have like what you're saying. I'm like, can you expand on like five different things that you just said? There's like, you're just saying things that, that you're like, oh yeah, well, this is what you do. And over here, we're like, what we run into is when we talk to people from Australia, they kind of like the stuff that's normal for you guys is like, we didn't even hear it yet. You know what I mean? So well, like it kind of gets glossed over. <laughs> so, I'm yeah. really expert guys, you know, I'm, I'm probably third year into keeping blue tongues and you know, they're, they're definitely not some of the, the highest, <laughs> highest tech stuff that I've ever had to keep, but there's still things that I learn everything, every single season and I'm still calling, you know, Joe and I'm still calling the friends and going, Hey, what have I done wrong? Um, but you know, that the, the whole situation with the male is, you know, for me personally, our, our reptile keepers, oh, us, we've got this bad habit of, of getting things up to size quickly and expecting them to do everything that a five-year-old animal will do. So, you know, yes, I was kick, kissed on the proverbial in the first year. My male was 300 grams and he was yeah, an absolute Trojan. You know, I couldn't, mm -hmm. I could put a piece of rope in there and he tried to mate it. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's not the norm. And we just need to start expecting, accepting things that are outside of norm. Um, but realistically, I think if you've got a male that, that might not be performing, 
if you've got the opportunity to have another male in the area that is performing, get your animals really, really hot. You know, get them to a point that they would generally be at mm, if it was like 25 to 26 degree day outside and they've been sitting on a rock that's, you know, t- you touch it with your hand in the middle of the day and it's actually quite warm. You know, those guys during during this, this period of time when they're coming out of cooling in the wild, they'd be, you know, getting themselves revved up. They would be sunning themselves for a considerable amount of time and then they'd be going on an adventure to find a female, you know. They, Can you... Can I ask like just like a couple of these questions? And Dave's like laughing at me. Um, <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to put these animals away before they go walkabouts. Give me a sec. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not. Um, I'm not laughing at you. I just. Um, I love listening to Chris talk. Um, I'm going to try to listen. I'm actually probably going to watch this interview a couple times and start picking up on things he's saying. So I start like some of this my every day. Like, I'm like- really enjoying this. Almost everything he just said there is the opposite of what I hear people talking about doing over here to get success with Easterns. <laughs> like heating them up and we're like, we're trying to cool them down. And like we're cooling them down and heating them up super slow and breeding them before and, they like. Yeah, I, I think we suck at Easterns. Um, I think a lot of us and I think there's a lot to do with that. I think it's inbred, or inbred stock that we have here has a lot to do with it. Um, and nobody wants to outcross them because God forbid anybody that mentions it. Like. <laughs> Yeah, we're not uh, we're not out crossing it at the moment, just in case it stays on the cut. <laughs> yeah, nothing's getting out. No, we wouldn't because it'd be financial suicide over here. But <laughs> right. So, uh, okay, can I ask one quick question? Um, so, okay, so when you talk about heating up, um, you know, some species that we work with, if you get your males too hot, it actually cooks their sperm. Um, is that not something you've seen happen with um, blue tongues if you get them too hot? In my short experience, no. Um, and realistically, if the animal wants to get away from a hot a heat source, they will. Um, but no, in Very short funny. experience, three years, I don't think I've seen that sort of thing happen. But is that to say that it's not a thing? You know, it could, it could be. It could be the reason why people are having – it could be the reason why I had crappy success last year. You know what I mean? It, it's – for me personally, I feel like I couldn't get my room hot enough during the window when the females come out and the males weren't getting hot enough because the ambience weren't hot enough and I just didn't get the males over the females in time because they were tracking two weeks behind the females, you know. So um, I don't think, and again, someone more experienced might be able to, to fill that gap, but for me, I don't think getting an animal up to its operating temperature or to a point where it's just over its operating temperature and absolutely tuned in on everything it needs to do. I don't think that's going to be a something that's going to stop something from breeding. You know, but you look at you look at monitors, for example, when the monitor is at its optimum temperature, it is just it's dedicated to what it wants to do. You know, it's either going to feed or it's going to find its female and, and mate with it, or it's it's going to take your hands off. You know, if that's that's at peak peak temperature. But if you, you scale it down to half its operating temperature, they, they seem to be a little bit more considerate. You know, they, they seem to be a little bit more calculated. But in actual fact, they, they're just not at the temperature that they, they need to, to be absolutely gun-focused on what they need to do. So, you know, for, for me personally, mm-hmm. heating a blue tongue up to, you know, its optimum temperature as if it would it just finished basking and introducing it to a female when it's can been you, nice. Can you define optimum temperature? please, because we're just saying a word here. <laughs> it depends on who you speak to. You know, for, for me personally, my hotspots behind me uh, are set at around the 38 to 40 mark. Okay. Um, do the animals use it? Yes, they do. Do the animal, do I come out every morning and they're, they're basking for, and you know, a very short period of time? By all means. And look, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to give them something that's a little bit hotter. You know, some people keep them at... 33, 34, 35 on the hotspot. But I always give them that elevated hotspot at around 40, 42, just so they've got the option to use it if they want to. So the conversion on that, just to let people know, so for 38 is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is much hotter than even at 38. So you're saying 42. Okay. (laughs) Sounds like a plan. Seems like it's 107 degrees is what we're coming up with, 107, 110. Yeah. When you're cooling down your your easterns how low are you getting them and for how long and this is this again is a hot topic for debate and this could have been a failing of mine last year as well you know for me personally i've always been 
even with the geckos, I would literally walk into the room and I'd switch the power off and I'd come back and visit them in 16 weeks. You know, if that my ambient temperature in the room would necess- would basically be, you know, their lowest operating, which might have been 12 to 13, maybe 14 degrees, and it would fluctuate depending on the house heat. Holy crap. <laughs> now, with these guys, just remember, Northerns, you probably wouldn't get away with that. For Easterns, I've got Easterns out in my, my garden, which are wild ones. It got down to minus six, you know, for us. It, it, that, that's basically snow weather. It got down to minus six and these guys would have been in a log somewhere just chilling. So um, hmm. if you've got pure Easterns, I think that, you know, getting them down to, you know, you know, in a, an insulated box outside, if you keep them in a pit, getting them down to single digit temperatures probably isn't, isn't unheard of, you know, but for a Northern doing that's death sentence, you know, for a period. Right. You might get ones and twos sort of make their way through that sort of um, hibernation period, but you know the general consensus is that you'd kill things. So, um, you know, so this like in, the, in the mid to high thirties, right? Yeah, is that the conversion? Yeah, Roughly. you got the Americans. You know, conversions better than I do. <laughs> yeah, that's where it starts snowing around that temperature. So, yeah, he's probably spot on. Um, yeah. Look, and, and again, it comes down to what works for some people doesn't work for others. You know, I've got a friend that's forty-five minutes away from me. Um, west and they've got fairly similar weather patterns than we do and he keeps a lot of northern species outside uh, he's got an insulated box it's buried into the ground a little bit some straw in there um, and he's got animals that i would suspect probably shouldn't be outside and they're outside during the winter the general general rule for him is that if it if it, it, it thrives in its first winter outside so by thriving he'll check it every month just to make sure it's you know not wheezing um, if he gets a severe weather system, he'll go out and check the animals just to make sure that you know he's not doing the wrong thing there. But um, if he gets through the first winter without any issues, where he doesn't have to intervene and bring it back inside, um, it's generally okay for the following and subsequent winters. Um, for me personally, I don't want to take that chance when I've got a room full of um, mutation blue tongues. So last year, I think my room got down to about 10 degrees as an ambient, give or take. And I think I might have had one, one or two um, nights where it may have dropped below that. Um, now, what I do is off the tail end of that is I'll give them two to three hours of heat in the morning um, so they can get up to, to whatever temperature they they want post that. But, you know, last year, was I really seeing them come out of their hide to come and bask or anything similar? Not really. You know, they might yeah. pick a position they're comfortable with, uh, sit in there and off they go. But again, this year I'm going to try something different. This year I'm going to keep the room at probably 18 degrees um, and give them a, a more gentle uh, transition into that because just because of my geography. You know, I can't get away with what I used to get away with, which is just walking in and switching the room off. Um, here, if I did that, I'd probably come into a, a room full of dead skins. You know, so if I've insulated this room to within an inch of its life this year. Um, I've built a basically a room within the room or within a shed. Um, and plus they've got, I'm going to try with four hours of heat a day um, just to, to bring them up. Because again, I've now got high percentage Northern stuff. So I've got to, I've got to accommodate. Mm-hmm. So what about so now I'm just dissecting the things that you were already talking about. Yeah, um, you're like, Oh, so you real quick. You just make sure that the male sheds off its sperm plugs. And then you, and you, I'm, I'm like, what? Like, cause we've never, never really so thought about that. Usually I, I think, I don't want to speak for every American blue tongue skin keeper or whatever, but everybody says you don't pair until after they start have their first shed after they come out of cooling. Like, but for us, for example, this year, our, all of our Easterns were only breeding before the first shed. And after they shed, they stopped breeding. Like they did just, so it's complete opposite. And I think that of the seven females that we have confirmed, we may have five or six litters. It looks that way. So like, I wonder. This, this is the thing, you know, depending on who you speak to is depending on what process works for them. You know, I've got got a friend again, that friend that's 45 minutes away from me, you know, he's like, my males will go hammer and tong once they've had a shed. They might decide to breed before that, but once they've had a shed, for the first two days after the shed, they are just so focused on breeding. Whereas the first year I bred these, my male, firstly, I thought was way too small. I think he's about 280 grams. Um, 
he was so focused on shagging the minute he got a bit of heat in, you know. So mm. I just thrown him in there the minute because I put my hand in there and he tried to bite me. And this is this is an animal that's docile, you know. I've, I handle these quite regularly. It's a blue tongue skin for God's sakes. But um, for us, if you handle these regularly, they're, they're not nasty. So for him trying mm. to grab my hand, was in shed, had just come out of cooling. I'm like, oh, I'll try this. I'll try this. So I threw him in there and he just. I think he went over three or four females that year. Um, wow. Any hesitation? He hadn't even shed. Like he's he bred with them. I think about two two weeks later, I think he shed. So he bred with half a dozen female or half a dozen times throughout that time. Anyway, I think it was every second day I was throwing him throwing him in with a different female. So, um, but then you've got other people, and I, I experienced this last year where one of my males wouldn't do anything until after he had shed, and that shedding process took way too long. It's like, mate, hurry up and shed. I'm going to start peeling the skin off you. Um, mm. So, you know, I think all the melanistic males, for example, uh, all three of those got, I think, two weeks past when the females were woken up and they were still just going opaque. It's like, man, I'm going to miss this, this lineup. Um, but yeah, it just depends on the male. And I think me saying check the, the, the plugs and check the shedding and check the animal. I think I'm bringing that together because I'm, I'm hearing, because I'm, I've been in this for quite a, a, a few years with other things, um, I know quite a few people and I hear all these different uh, tidbits of information that come through and I'm implementing those in my checks. You know, I check to make sure that a male doesn't have a sperm plug block, blockage. I'm checking to make sure that, you know, the shed skin is actually coming off where it needs to come off. I'm checking toes for shed skin, retain, uh, retain shed skins. Um, you know, all the little things that you hear horror stories about, I'm implementing that in my day-to-day -day checks. So it may not necessarily apply to the animal, but I'd much rather know exactly what went wrong than mm -hmm. leave it in hands and, you know, six to eight weeks later have a, a hemipene infection or, um, you know, 12 weeks down the track, I've got an animal with some sort of ailment that I didn't pick up when I should have. Um, so with the um, sperm plug you're talking, um, there's going to be like a two-part question to this. Um, I mean, no, what kind of technique are you guys doing that? Is that like a massage technique? I mean, I know this is not a species that's very easy to pop, and there's some people that claim they can do it. But, um, I mean, how are you going about that? Well, I've got a particular male here um, that's quite large, and it's only recently come into the collection. Um, it's a friend's animal, and it last year wouldn't breed. And then towards the end of the tail end of the season – they took it to a vet because the hemipene area had actually not, it wasn't fest, uh, fested, it wasn't, um, you know, really oozing or anything, anything, but it was just, it was swollen. Uh, and they pushed out the biggest plug out of each side that they had ever had. And like, in, they'd never seen it. And they had other experienced reptile keepers do it for them. So that particular animal, I'm just checking on probably a, a fortnightly basis just to see what's built up there. And what I do is, you know, bending back the tail and popping is not necessarily the, the best way to do it uh, because you end up damaging the animal. But um, what I do is once the animal's secure, I'll usually just put a bit of pressure on the underneath of the tail just in the centre of where the two hemipenes sort of meet and I'll put the index finger on the outer edge of the tail and I'll squeeze in. And generally that, that motion... Um, well, you do it gently, of course, you're not just manhandling it, but um, we'll generally extrude whatever is in, in the hemipane. Um, so, I didn't mean to interrupt, so if I ask you to go get that mail right now and do it, do you think you could actually get a little plug out of it? Mm, I did it a couple of weeks back, so I'll have a quick look, but give me a sec. Yeah, no problem, just curious about that. Thing. We could even put like some cool like sex music in when he's doing this i think it'd be you're not even allowed to say sex or you're demonetized <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do this every week how about hey how does this make you feel sex with a midget <laughs> is, that? <laughs> uh, is that a helmet hair wow <laughs> just i didn't even know you could get helmet hair as an auction <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much a biggest one i just got the tail end of that but um yeah, why are you making me do this, Dave? Seriously. Okay, get get a big picture on this. We need the full frame. We need oh, the yeah. full frame for sure. Look at this. Okay. Right, so see, see, look, see the two big lumps there? Yeah. Yeah. Those are heavy paints. So there's one in particular that's a little bit larger than the other, and that's mm -hmm. generally where the buildup is. So what I'll do is uh, I'll try and get in here. So there's generally a um, like a gap here. 
And that's obviously where the two hemipene pockets are on each side. So what I'll do is I'll put a finger here and the thumb on the outside there. And that's over the, the vent? Yeah, it's just before the vent. Sorry, he's not really cooperating, but he knows no. that's coming. Um, so basically a finger there, a finger on the outside here, and then I'll put um, equal pressure in the middle there and on the outside, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll roll. So from there to there. I'm not going to try and do it again because I don't think he's going to be cooperative and you probably won't get no. the edge that you need. But support the animal, finger in the middle, and finger on the side and slowly massage. And hmm. because the, the, the plug would pretty much take up the whole cavity, um, you would expect that if there's pressure in there, this thing should pop out relatively quickly. Now, this particular fellow, when he come to me, um, he had a little bit of a, like a harder plug because he's, for some reason, he just produces sperm and more and more and more and just fills, fills up the pocket. So uh, it's definitely not infection because we've, I've had him on a course in antibiotics when uh, I first started to notice this sort of stuff. And I really just think he's just, just produces too much. Um, he's healthy. Otherwise he smashes food. He smashes my hand. Um, you know, that, that's generally a really good sign. And he's an absolute horse of an animal. He's, yeah. he's not overweight at all. And he's still probably about 600 grams, which is, is, for an eastern northern mix, it's probably pretty normal, but he's just an absolute beefcake. Um, but look, I think it, it wouldn't hurt, you know, if you, if you feel like there's some swelling there or something's not right, just check the hemipenes. You know, it could be something, it could be a blockage. Um, mm. Alternatively, what I've heard, or, you know, I'm, I'm a bird person, so for me, I know exactly what this, this particular item is, but a bird crop needle, a bird crop needle that is, you know, it's basically hollow stainless steel. Um, ball ended uh, syringe tip. And if you get one that's at the right diameter, if you've got an issue or you feel like this particular animal and vets that are watching this are probably going to be horrified, but um, it's a probe. Yeah, it sounds like a probe. a probe. It's basically a hollow probe that you put a syringe tip on it. Um, I would probably use some saline or something similar uh, if you feel like there's something lodged in there or something not quite right. Um, get it in there to a comfortable level. Obviously, have someone restrain the animal so that you're not um, causing any damage. And then gently trickle trickle some of the saline solution in there to see if there is. Uh, so it flushes it out. There's like a hole yeah. at the end. Yeah, and similarly, I've heard that people will use um, KY jelly. So you know, there, there might be um, an animal that is having trouble getting its hemipene out. You know, it wants to mate, but it's not actually getting that hemipene out. Um, using the same principle and, and using a bit of bit of lube to to lube up that area. Just remember, like, these animals have been in sleep mode for however long when they've come out, they're probably a little bit dry. You know, they might need a bit of, bit of, a, bit of a, a rev up to get some, some fluids going so they can get it out. So That's I, got Dave going. Look at it. Yeah. The first smile yeah. I saw it all night. It's... I'm extremely excited right now. Extremely excited. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the uh, quiver of the mustache. It was just a tell. It was a quiver. It was a quiver. Oh, okay. right. You know. I, I have to say, uh, Chris, that was the first time I've ever seen anybody do that or even really to talk about this, to be honest. Um, and – the likes of Joe Ball's probably going to watch this later and go, oh, Chris, what about that? <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, I just think little things like that, being able to, to identify little things like that throughout the season, not only prevent larger items or larger issues from, from happening later on, you know, for example, a blockage in a hemipene, I think Joe's put on various different um, videos or, or photos of what a hemipene that is heavily infected and filled with gunk looks like. It's it's not pretty, you know, it's it's obviously very painful for the animal as well. And, you know, something like that could completely ruin your season. You know, if you miss that just before a cooling period and you've got an animal with a, a complete blockage and, you know, or even just a partial blockage and you've missed it for whatever reason and just played it off like, oh, he wasn't interested in, in shagging this year. Hmm. Um, these animals will hide that sort of thing. You know, going into cooling, coming out of cooling, it'll get much worse. You know, their immune system drops and then as you, as you heat them back up again, whatever ailment's been annoying them throughout winter is, is going to flare up tenfold. And that's, if that animal is a pinnacle animal for your breeding season, you're pretty much stuffed. You know, it's, mm. it's another year behind and it's another year that you've got to wait. And, you know, us, us reptile keepers tend to be a little bit impatient with that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, if you're, you're in that mutation race or trying to work a particular project, being put behind 12 months is enough to be off-putting, you know? Hmm. 
And such oh, wow. a technique as doing that massage on a, a very gentle massage on a hemipene before and after cooling, I don't see how that could be damaging at all. Like that's yeah, probably a pretty standard procedure, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, ball python guys do that. Um, you know, that's one thing too. Like when we're moving males around, especially before they start breeding. I mean, we're always giving them a pop to get those big, um, you know, big bugs out, and yeah. I think it helps out. And there's a lot of guys. I think um, Mutation Creation just made a post the other day saying how they do that with every male just before you introduce it into a female. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, just shut off those uh, hemipenal castings. We get them out of the way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I I personally don't see an issue with it. You know, there there might be some people out there that may not be experienced enough to do it properly. Um, so just just understand the caveat is here that, you know, you can do damage, you know, if you put too much pressure on and, um, you know, do it, the, use the wrong technique or don't have the animal restrained, you, you can do damage. So um, if you're not comfortable doing it, take it to a vet. The vet will be more than happy if you explain what's going on. And I'm not sure what your vet veterinary network's like over there, but, you know, we've got very specific reptile vets in each state. <laughs> They do talk to each other, you know, especially here. They do talk to each other, you know, that they're, they're implementing techniques that are uh, uh, being communicated. And, you know, they're very keen in some cases to actually get involved with these types of animals because it's new to them. Um, so, look, if you, if you work with your vet, vet reptile or a reptile vet or your, um, your reptile friends, you know, if they've got the experience, if they're open to it, just get someone else to show you what's going on. Have a feel for it, understand the animal. You know, if the animal's squirming, the animal's absolutely losing its marbles, it's obviously hurting it or you're doing something incorrectly. Because when when I when he has got a bit of a build up and I need to to give it a, a push, it doesn't take much to get it out. It's basically, you know, it's it's cavities full, it's it's something that shouldn't be in there, and that rolling motion will generally get it to come out quite quickly. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, definitely uh, seek some mentorship if you're uh you're new at it. Like, don't just go crazy. But a lot of us have been doing this for like five, 10 years. You know what I mean? Like we know how to read our animals a little bit and it's not so risky. You know what I mean? But you know, okay. I, any I, doubts, I, find a mentor. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, well, you guys, I'm sure you've got plenty over there too, but you know, the old, the old mentality here seems to be shifting. So knowledge seems to be going two ways now. Whereas, 10 or 15 years ago, it was you bought five animals, you ended up with three, you were pretty happy with it. Um, and you, you made your own way. Whereas now at the internet and everything like that, and you know, Joe's been very forthcoming with information to, to the people that um, do right by him. So you know, I'm, I'm lucky where I've got those senior, senior people within our, our hobby to be able to call upon if I need to. And, you know, if you're an absolute twat, you're obviously not going to get that information out of your colleagues, so to speak. But, you know, if if you actually ask the right questions and you do it in the right manner and you treat those people with respect, the, the information definitely flows. Hmm. Yes. Right on. Um, we'll move on to another animal, unless you wanted me to answer any of the two prong questions that I may have missed the second point. <laughs> No, but let's let's see another animal. We'll go from there. I'm sure we have a few more basic questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> like so who does your hair? <laughs> my hair. This is this is um, this is uh, called isolation hair. <laughs> this is so long. At the moment. I I have a haircut every second or third week, and my local barber's actually closed. So I'm I'm sending them abusive messages every. <laughs> but um this particular one is an anery so oh that's cool that's um, real cool there's a couple of different types of anery that sort of kick around for us um this particular one's probably the pinnacle of an anery and i would say that it's it's to do with the, the high northern influence um there's absolutely no yellow or red pigments in this animal whatsoever it's just basically shades of gray um this one is the one that is produced lucky behind us, um, or the one that I showed you before. It produced 15 babies in its first year, um, or first year of breeding. Um, is an absolute champion of animal. This, this particular one will never go anywhere. Uh, it's one of my favorites and it'll be a pet for life. So, um, but so the, just real quick, the anery is a recessive? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, just it is. double checking, like, so we, we well, I think Joe, Joe dubbed this the black-eyed anery. 
uh, when it's mixed with a lot of other stuff, it, it creates the likes of the snows. Um, the differences or the variation with these types of animals is that you will get some with um, yellow sidebars that sort of sneak through in a, a really subdued pattern. Um, and those particular ones would, would not necessarily make the white snows. Um, so we're, we're kind of thinking that this particular one would probably be a visual hypo-ish type animal. And when you pair um, similar things back to each other, you generally get your white snows that pop out. But um, strangely mm -hmm. enough, this one has, uh, I'm not sure if you can see on the head there, there's some um, dotting. Oh, you got the Kimberly spot in? Yep. So that, yeah. that essentially is a really, as you can see, this animal's very trusting of me, but um, that particular trait is very Kimberly. And that would be reminiscent of um, Joe's outcrossing with a lot of the Kimberly Norlands. So um, me personally, I would love to see, or I love to see all of those, those the, the dotting. Um, we kind of chase all of our blotch blue. I don't have any blotch blue tongues, but I yeah, plan to get them uh, in the future. But um, a lot of the keepers generally chase the blotch blue tongues with a lot of the, the facial dotting. Uh, and I can understand why, because they, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, oddly enough, every single baby that's come out of her has usually been double her size. Um, which is super odd because uh, the genetics mm. you expect to be passed down from mum. But um, and dad is, I think the first year I used a, an Eastern Eastern mix, which was the smaller male, and um, the babies that come out of her are just absolutely massive. When I compare her to the albinos that have popped out of her over the last couple of years, it's just insane. They're they're a good, um, you know, this much longer than her. Solid heads on them. The the dotting has come through thankfully on the head. The, the other albino that I showed you has got that dotting starting to appear. Um, so yeah, look, it's, I, I always set out when, when I seen the annery, that was what kicked me off to go and say, Hey Joe, I need half a dozen animals. I need them all to be different and they're just going to be pets. Uh, and it's, it's mm -hmm. set me down this path of destruction. So, um, but yeah, I've got two of these guys. I might actually grab the other one just so I can show you the comparisons within and these, these are sisters. Um, so you can see the comparisons within the litter and you can tell that, there is that Eastern influence starting to sort of creep through in the back end. Okay. Ooh. Nothing? You guys are silent? You guys are... Yes, well, I, I got questions for him. Like, how quickly do you heat up? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. aren't there, there are multiple lines of Anry, right? And, like, are um, they compatible? Look, I think there's only one particular Anry at the moment. I think there's people out there toting that they've got another another form of anery but when we look at the visuals they just don't seem right um and okay. the, worst, the worst part of anery for me personally is you know i've only ever had the best of the best you know i've only ever had the ones that are completely void of yellow pigment but the offside or the the i call it the reject bin take it the right way um there are those ones that have high pigmentation down the sides. And that, that personally, because I've had that pinnacle anery, I, I wouldn't, I see that as like a B grade type situation. And it, the fact that an anery can punch out something that is so variable, depending on the genetics behind it and the color palette, um, it makes it very hard to identify until you put it into an albino. So mm -hmm. I know there's a couple of other breeders out there, uh, which I won't name, but they've, they've, toted around that they've had a, a different line of anery. Um, and it comes down to the old, is that your line or is it something you've just reproduced from someone else's? Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think the argument here is that, you know, once you get three outcrosses removed from the original stock that you bought, then you can tote that as your own line because you've done that work. Whereas here, um, we're finding that people get someone else's animal. And I wouldn't say everybody. So if anyone else is watching this, I'm not thinking. <laughs> the generalization but um there are a couple of breeders out there that paint themselves as you know breeding more animals than they do and that they've found something new um and they've painted it that they've got a different line of anery so it kind of muddies for those that aren't in the know it kind of muddies what we're actually collectively trying to do which is broaden um, the paint palettes broaden the mutations that we're working with and actually identify traits that are inheritable not something that's polygenic and it's not to take away from them but it you know when a newbie comes in and starts asking me for for animals that aren't necessarily a genetic trait but another breeder has painted it as something new and then they're like well no i'm not going to take that information because you're wrong well, no actually i'm not uh it becomes quite hard for everybody when you know we don't have that new thing that isn't actually a new thing 
Well, you, I mean, if we have to cut this out, that's fine because I don't want to cause any drama or anything. But you know, Colin Schumark, right? Because you came over with those guys, right? To yes. Tinley. He, yep. he popped out a, a black eyed annery sort of I saw on the video. And we're friends with him, so we don't want to cause any trouble or whatever. But, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why I brought it up because I know he said he something popped out that he wasn't sure about and it had black eyes and looked annery and he was trying to prove it out. But I'm pretty sure the stuff that Colin got was actually stuff from Joe, which is same animal disease. That would make um, sense. And I think early days when the black eye annery popped out, and again, I don't want to speak out of school with process or you know what actually happened but i think when these popped out no one necessarily really knew what they had i think the the whole gotcha. element, just the white northern and an anery um i think that really popped out and again i don't know what colin's done but i know he did have some success with some animals that he got from joe and look if he did have another line of anery that popped up and i'm sure there's more than one i'm sure but you know, with such a small genetic pool that we have here, it wouldn't surprise me if they stem from the same animals at some point and it's just been sitting in someone's collection and they've been unsold and they've been unsold. And Provided that they're compatible, it's reasonable to assume that it's the same line, just certain, you know. You'd expect, so. You'd expect so. But having said that, there's been some things that have been alien in the past that have been completely unrelated. That's so, true. Uh, it, it's just a case of test breeding. You know? But then there's, there's people out there that have, have actually got two animals, had something different pop out. And yeah, okay, it could be something different, but they've not done the test breeding. So they've not done the, the three years worth of back end work and they're trying to tote it around as another the next five thousand dollar mutation. You know, it's I think mm -hmm. that's probably in, in both our both our patches. But um, so what do you got there? This one here is the sister to the last animal that I just had them. Um, you can tell that they are they are uh, related. But you can just tell they're two completely separate animals. So this particular one is a much bigger, chunkier, longer, northern reminiscent type animal uh, with size, head shape, but it holds the eye band. So the other one didn't have an eye band, which is probably more reminiscent of your northern, your Kimberley. But this mm -hmm. one here, that eastern eye band, that's kind of creeping its way through. Hmm. But you know, I can assure you her attitude is 110% northern. <laughs> <laughs> She's warmed up to her optimum temperature. She usually tries to take my face off. So, and yeah, that's a beautiful animal. No, no side patterning, but obviously a little bit more busy with um, the top end patterning there. And her size is obviously much bigger. Yeah. Strangely, nice. enough, the last couple of years, I think her first litter, when we put it through, she had five stillborn snows, uh, which absolutely killed me. Um, and then she had one of each of everything else. So she had one head one anery and one albino in her first year. So she was she was my disaster wow. piece in the first year. And then obviously last year, I actually missed the opportunity to breed her because she was uh, trying to combat with every single male who whacked in because she wasn't ready. Uh, and then we just missed missed the, uh, the window, unfortunately. But um, again, another animal that because I've, she's one of my founder ones, I probably won't part with her at any point. Um, but yeah. It's just, it just goes to show there's, there's massive differences even in some of the variation. And, and when you see things come through, you know, I've got some, uh, some Christmas hats that Joe sent down to me as a, as a gift um, that are, you know, all from the same, same litter from my understanding. And you look at all three of them and there's some similarities between two, but they're different. And then there's a complete uh, 180 with the other one uh, that looks Eastern. So mm -hmm. You know, that's pretty much what we deal with. I absolutely actually like the idea of being able to produce, you know, 10 different animals within the same sort of color palette in a litter. Uh, it just gives me some things to work with without having to spend, you know, 10 grand on new animals every time something pops out. But um, yeah, it's they, these are uh, bordering on four years now. So uh, still doing really well. Weight's not over the top. So just real quick, not to take you off topic, but we, Keep, I just hear like you saying this is a her, this is him, and all this stuff. It just brings me back to sexing skinks and yeah. different techniques and things that are going on. Like over here, we essentially have you can either pop it, which you're not supposed to do. Everybody's like, don't pop a skink, or you can guess looking at their you know body structure. And I know over there, you guys are doing like contrast radiography with some success. Uh, to find, you know, the hemipenes and all that. But is there any other techniques that were, I know some people have been screwing around with like DNA testing of sheds and, and whatnot. 
Look, I don't think the D last last time I checked, and I think I had an argument um, because I've been in isolation. I've been a bit touchy, but I had an argument with someone online the other day, which is unlike me, uh, <laughs> about DNA testing. And I really don't think the DNA testing is at the level where it's commercially viable, firstly, and it's 100% reliable. I think there's something in the background. I'm not a geneticist. Um, I usually call Justin Julander for all of my... Um, hey. Weird ass immunology and um, back end DNA testing techniques and all that based on his expertise. But um, for me personally, I don't think DNA is where it's at, where it can be rolled out reliably or cost effective. Um, for me personally, every single animal that I set out to, to sex, I'm one of those people that likes an ultimate, ultimate decision, ultimate outcome. Um, and the best way for me to do that is to make sure that I know the sex of the animals if they're important to a breeding project. I've got you know, last year I took 20 or 30 animals in to, to be um, sex via x-ray. But even that, yeah. even that isn't reliable. You know, if you get an animal too early, you know, it's up to interpretation of the, the, the end reports that come through. You know, it's up to someone to actually physically look at the x-ray and go, well, I think that's bordering male and female. And a couple of these, these skinks, if they're done too early, um, they can actually look female when they're actually male. You know, it's they're really mm-hmm. just... A- whether they tightened up when they were, when they had the the hemi pains uh, filled up with that that barium or whatever it is that they use um, or radium sorry barium probably hot bloody nuclear skinks but um, <laughs> the, the radium that they whack in for the contrast you know if if that skin tightens up it's obviously not shooting that right to the bottom of the hemi pain or the pocket so you mm-hmm. know, might a sporadic shape or they might spill a little bit because it's squirted it out whilst they're trying to put it on the, the table. So um, there was a couple last year, which thankfully I ended up keeping for myself, uh, which turned out to be male when I'd held them back as female based on the based on the x-rays. And um, given how time poor I was last year, I just went, okay, report, no dramas. What's the end report? Is it male? Is it female? No worries, sold, unsold, moved on. Um, but uh, realistically, when I got to just before cooling and I'm like, ooh, put a couple of females in with each other because I had some space issues last year and they're starting to fight. Or hmm. just get, get little niggly, niggly arguments here and there in the cage. I'm like, oh, I'm going to check those. So again, use that rolling technique and when you get a sperm plug come out and you're like, damn it, I was actually going to use you this year. Uh, That's a bit, true. Hmm. bit of a situation that kind of leaves you a bit upset. But yeah, look, at, I, re- I really don't use visuals. I sit there and I... I send a million million and one photos between frames like what do you think this is put a put a sex on it and we'll we'll throw 50 down on it in the next six months but you know for if we had a dollar for every time we were right mm-hmm. we'd probably have one or two dollars in our pocket you know what i mean out of 50 animals <laughs> you know, an animal from day one there's a lot of people that say oh i can sex them i know what's male and female but it's super variable like we have animals here that are like you know I would swear up and down it's a male and it produced, you know, babies last year. So, you know what I mean? Like it's very variable for sure. And when you take into account with the Eastern stuff, Eastern stuff, generally, once it's mature, you just look at it and you, you if you see a male, it's, it's a male. It's like 95% chance that it's male. Um, and when you've got an adult that's three or five years old, that's a pure Eastern city in front of you, it's, it's kind of really hard to miss the two. But when you've got something that's a mixed of mixed origin, uh, it's been fed quite well, so it's probably grown a little bit quicker than it should, or a bit quicker than something that's in the wild and taken uh, some time to mature. You generally find that the head sizes and the body sizes and stuff are a little bit uh, disproportionate. So, you know, if you've mm-hmm. been feeding something quite heavily to get it up to size for a year, or uh, it's a really good feeder, so it's just holding a bit of weight on it, um, you generally find that you can't tell the difference. You know, it's the only way to do it is just to go down to the vet get that x-ray set testing done, at least have a baseline. And if it then goes backwards from there, just know that you might have a 20% um, rate of failure on, on that particular x-ray. But I think if something's around the 250 gram mark and you go and get an x-ray, you're not in a rush. You don't try and do them at 150 grams when they're a little bit smaller. Um, I think the result's pretty steadfast. Mm-hmm. It's all about like mediating that percentage. You know what I mean? Like I can do with a 20%. I'm wrong, you know what I mean? On holding back males and females, like we, it's a sort of expected. So that's not bad at all. Um, One thing I learned last year 
was to always hold back at least 10% for yourself, you know, and the year that I decided or had come to that, um, that epiphany is the year that I produced one baby, you know, <laughs> But moving forward, I, I will be keeping 10 to 15% back and regardless of the money involved, regardless of my personal situation at the time, it's just, I have, you have to do it because, you know, you, your prime breeder, the one that, you know, my two, two favorites here, um, you know, if they decide that they don't want to do something for the year, having backups is really important. I learned that last year. So, you know, if you, if you have sure. 10 animals for a project and you're only planning to breed three make sure you keep the 10 until the project sees sees its end goal because you, you will at some point need them. something is better than nothing when it comes down to that you know what i mean <laughs> right so, but um you know lessons learned over the time and young keepers don't fall into the same trap as what us older stuff older failures fall into. so um so a genetic question which we've dabbled in this conversation in the past and it's a very touchy subject here um, so our northern breeding here, um, you know, we have a lot of really unique um, polymorphic traits, um, you know, yellow lines, dark lines, orange lines, a lot of different orange lines, red lines. Um, I brought these up to you because, you know, you guys don't have any of this. You know, you guys are, you know, doing a lot of morph stuff, but I've never seen anything like what we have coming out of what you have. And you had an opinion on that, which, you know, a little sensitive opinion. <laughs> Look, Essentially, think, we're, we're inbreeding the crap out of our stuff. Is that? What? <laughs> I wouldn't. You know, and I, I learned this from Bird World. Um, and look, I think this is. We've all done this. We've all gone rushing to a new mutation that takes our fancy, and that new mutation, <laughs> the standard goal when that new mutation pops up is that we want to reproduce it as quickly as possible. We want to be the first person with it. We want to capitalize on the investment that we've made. We want to capitalize on our time, and we want to have our, our name in lights. So. You know, the genetic diversity with those animals can only stretch so far unless you're going to put in the time to actually outcross and do all your bits and pieces. But, you know, yes, personally, I feel like, and this is probably a collective between you and you and I, Dave, that, um, you know, you do have a limited gene pool there. You don't have an infinite amount of animals, but neither do we. Neither do we, you know, if, without outcrossing. And I've been lucky. Joe does all the outcrossing. I buy new animals. Um, <laughs> You know, that, that's how it's been for the last four years. Um, whereas you guys, you don't have that ability to just go out and get a box of 20 Indonesian blue tongues sent to you because there's a process. You know, with those 20, you might end up with three that are viable. You know, mm. you guys have been doing, and not just that, you guys have a completely different eye for this type of stuff than what we do. You know, you, you have the ability to mass produce. You have the ability to hold back your whole season and do it all again the following year. You know, those red things you're working on, um, Dave, like I would kill to have those so that I could put those into an albino, you know, but at the same time you would kill for what we've got. So look, personally, I think that you guys are doing really well with what you've got. Um, I'm seeing some of the, like, because I've started jumping on some of the blue tongue um, pages that are statewide or state-based and I'm seeing some of your projects pop in, you know, the, the white things that are slowly sort of getting to being white. You know, your black things that are starting to, to go down the routes of a full melanistic northern. Um, yeah. I love all of that stuff, but I don't think, I think over here we've had that morph, morph race take uh, precedence over, say, line breeding Kimberleys. You know, not to say there's not people still doing that sort of stuff, but when you've only got, um, you know, a Kimberley blue tongue looks like a Kimberley blue tongue. A Tunnel Creek blue tongue looks like, uh, it has the characteristics of a Tunnel Creek blue tongue. You know, realistically, the only thing you've got to do there is strengthen what's already present. And there's not a great deal of variation from what I've personally seen in amongst those those localities. So, you know, for us to pop up a melanistic, it probably is a genetic melanistic when it pops up. You know, it's not a transition to get to that point. And uh, I think I said to Dave, you know, a lot of the stuff you guys are working on seems like you're not too far off mm. or not many generations off actually getting to a result where it's a genetic result you know it's not just a polygenic thing you know those uh, those red things you know, actually you know, i'm going to throw back to something that troy k had brought up and i think it might have come from his brother denver at the time that by the eighth generation of enemy that's when you start to get mutation and is that mutation beneficial mutation or is that mutation something that 
is a detriment to the animal. Um, when you start in breeding, you need to know what to look for. You need to pick the best of the lot. You need to pick the biggest and the robust of the lot, whether that means that it is the best based on your project or whether that's best based on um, form or how it's put together or health. You know, you, you need to do a 50-50 split there. You need to go down the best route from a size for a health perspective, but you also need to err on the, the edge and go down the routes of getting stuff that, you know, the, the best coloured, which is always guaranteed to be the wrong. It's always guaranteed to be something that has something wrong with it. You need to go down that route. You need to do an outcross if you need to bring in, um, you know, a bit of strength and you need to keep continuing down both paths. But, um, yeah, look, I, I don't think you're that far off. I, if in the next couple of years, seeing there's really been a focus on blue tongues, you guys don't start pumping out mutation after mutation, I'd be shocked. I'd be absolutely shocked because it, we're doing it. We, we seem to have mutations pop up left, right and centre and we've only really just taken the tip, or Joe, I should say, has taken the tip off the iceberg. There's a couple of smaller mutations. I think um, Gavin uh, Gavin has bought you know, these these particular single factor uh, patlas. I'm not sure where they originated with him, but he's doing a lot of the, the Eastern type stuff and you know he's popping out pure Eastern mutations based on you know his projects. And in 10 years' time, we're all going to be focused on different projects and we're all going to have something new to bring to the table. Um, and same with you. you know, those red things, I, I don't know where that's going to go, but if that pops out in Albino, that, that red, you know, I, you basically trumped all of what we're doing. Um, the, the melanistic northern, if that pops out to be a completely black lizard at some point, you know, and it's at the moment it's really just the sidebars that seem to be quite black. Um, if you pop out a, a full pure northern uh, melanistic lizard, you know, that's that might be better than our eastern based stuff. You know, it's there's still accolades in their own. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, and you know, the best thing too, um, you know, in the United States right now is, you know, this species just kind of became popular, yet we've had it here for a very long time. And, you know, there's a few OGs in the hobby, like we have our Fen and we have our Ray Gurney, um, that have been at this for a long time. But I actually love the fact that we have so many new people doing this now, because like you said, with more people doing it, the more chances of peculiar things popping up that we can turn into something real over time if we put the time in. Um, and you know, we had, you watched the junior one where he's talking about like leopard gecko goose family, how they picked up a yellow one. And I don't know if that was a hyper exanthic project he was calling it, but that was Sunday line bread. Did he say over the course of eight years before eventually it became what you would consider a mutation still arguably, um, polymorphic, but you know, it was something that it became so strong from years of line breeding. They could put it to something very basic and still produce very beautiful animals very close to what took eight or nine years to produce in the first place. Um, so yeah, I love all the different directions. And like you said, I think it's um, Diana and Rebecca here working on the darker stuff. Um, I love Rebecca. Uh, I love all that dark stuff. I, I almost obsess over that more than the red stuff sometimes, just because I'd love to see us get to a solid black or at least 90% solid black um, and then see how that crosses out from there. But you know, like you said, we, we don't have a lot to play with here. We don't have more necessarily popping up. Um, you know, there are a couple of mutations that have popped up in collections here. And, you know, it's really funny. Um, we actually have a breeder in the state of Missouri that picked up two animals. Um, one came from a trade show, and I believe it was down in Florida. And then he bought another animal from a pet store. And when you look at them, they're both fairly um, what looks to be an Erie and Giant Northern hybrid. When bred together, they ended up producing aneurythristics. And I think I sent you pictures of the aneurythristics. Um, yeah. But, you know, just the craziness or the thought that, you know, a hybrid to a hybrid or these two random animals to random across the country went together and made a recessive project. And even like with the patternless project that I believe started in Europe, that was an Erie and Jaya Northern cross. Um, they put two hybrids together that, again, popped out another recessive project. Um, which again is mind blowing that that could even happen that way. Um, but yeah, like I said, the genetic side on this, it's still trying to figure it out. Um, I will say that I think overall as a community, people have taken five or six steps forward in a very short period of time. Um, and like you said, with some of the red stuff we produce, you know, we outcrossed that a generation from the Jeff Greenstock we had. And some of the animals we brought them out to were not that unbelievable, very classic looking. But then breeding those babies back to the fathers or something nearly related produced the best reds we've ever produced. Um, so, you know, I do believe in breeding them out. Um, I do think that makes them a lot stronger, of course. 
because honestly, I think some of our prettiest animals are our weakest breeders. Um, just mm -hmm. unfortunately, the drop dead gorgeous males you want to do it every year just are not doing anything for us. And I got a sunset um, years ago. I want to say it was about six years ago, seven years ago at Timley. And it was actually just about to go in a box to Japan. But um, luckily, Dai, um, a guy I know through Junior, was nice enough to sell me the one that was in shed that was dog shit. And it ended up being the prettiest one out of all of them. She's yet to give me a baby, and I've been working at her for six years. Um, but she is the most gorgeous sunset I've ever seen. I can't get a baby out of her, though. Um, so, unfortunately. But well, go on. That was a long, long rant. You should try uh, massaging out the sperm plug. If you <laughs> yeah, well, it's a female. If I get sperm out of her, it's a whole other deal. Then, you know, we're going to reverse the process and go another direction. But, if it's um, a female, she probably would have gave you a baby in six years. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it me, okay, it did give me a couple slugs one year. Oh, there you go. go. So it had cycled oh, once. My bad. I, I apologize. I apologize. Did, yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. I, I'm not offended. I'll, I'll bitch at you after the episode. It's but, all right. Um, You're making the thumbnails, man. Next time I'm going to have a, you know, sumo wrestler body. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> did I do that? I would never do that to you. You're too beautiful for that. Like I said, you were the hottest wrestler out of the four of us last week. This is, this is why I love you. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's a terrible breeder, though. Beautiful, but terrible breeder. I yeah, very awful breeder. Really, breeder. really, really just can't get this whole thing down. But, um, you know, I'm at least I'm semi-attractive, and you guys like me. So, you know, I'm happy with that. How can you not love that mustache? And the, I mean, Kevin, and the Kevin Bacon shirt. Yeah, it is a nice Kevin Bacon shirt. I mean, he is a beautiful man. Um <laughs> But, all right, well, shit, um, let's see. Um, well, this is Ben's part of the episode where he likes to bring up Tiger King. Um, <laughs> have you been fortunate enough to watch Tiger King yet? I have watched the shit out of that. And um, okay. I've been watching, um, obviously, Danny Mendez over the years has been bringing up, bringing up um, interviews and such. And Danny, Danny Mendez. And I, Danny and I talk quite regularly. But um, I didn't know who the, I knew who this Tiger King was many years ago because Danny brought it up because he got these bloody spankly pants or something sent to him. And um, when this all hit Netflix, I was like, this is just another example of what I wouldn't do if I actually had access to those types of animals. You know, I mm -hmm. if I had the ability to keep tigers, and my other my partner's from Latvia, so in Latvia it's kind of middle of Europe so you want to keep something it's kind of reminiscent of Russia you want to do it you just do it um, and I'm looking I think we toyed around with me moving or us moving to Latvia at some point because I just I'd had a tough week in Australia and just got over it um, and I could keep tigers and I could keep this and I could keep that and I'm sitting there going you know what a blessing that is to be able to keep some of these majestic animals regardless of whether they're tigers bears you know um, lions all that sort of stuff tigers but then, you know, there's people over there that are taking these types of things for granted. And, you know, I, I get that whole scene. I've, I get that he's gone down a path of, of drugs and, this, and all that sort of, you know, destruction that comes with that from, you know, uh, staying at that path for too long and thinking you're invincible. But, you know, it's just it's such a wasted opportunity. It's, it's, they really need to come here for a little bit and realise what they can't have so that they can appreciate what they can have. So would you say that all Australians are extremely jealous that um, that documentary happened in the United States and Donald Trump's our president? Like, do you guys feel like you're really coming <laughs> over there? Whoa, okay. whoa, whoa. We're not supposed to do politics here. I'm <laughs> saying how great America is. This is not politics. <laughs> Look, I think, I think us Aussies have this preconceived notion that you guys are absolute gun crazy, toting, you know, massacrous type people, but... Uh, Wait, I mean, that's I not that direction throw, I thought I was going in. Go ahead. I need, need, to throw over, need to throw overweight in there as well because it's something that seems to be part of the demographic. But ah, you know, no, 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 you're going, you guys are fine. Um, but look, I think realistically, when I've when I've come over and I've actually met you guys and and seen how big your hearts are and and seen the the best of the best when I've walked over there and you know been shown an absolute brilliant time. It's you know, I think more Australians need to get out and actually make friends, like especially hobbyists, make friends overseas and go out and see what it is that makes up your lifestyle because, you know, that it definitely smashes the preconceived notions within 20 seconds. You know, yeah, like we don't all listen to uh, country music. Where no, I don't think any of us think that. I think most of us think you're either gangbangers or... Um, well, you're not wrong. 
Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, no. well, you know, well, the problem is, Chris, next time you visit, I'm going to take you through America. Yeah. You know, <laughs> America that you do not get to experience. And you're going to take it back and you're going to say all that shit's true. Yeah, no, I'm never going to play again. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was Josh Roberts that actually had to pull me out of a car window at 3 a.m. because I was yelling uh, Yoshiniqua out the window in the middle of Detroit. So, Ooh, yeah, um, yeah no, no, I've been there. I've been there and seen it. I don't think I should probably be allowed out drunk again. <laughs> no, um, honestly, I think you're really good at being drunk. Um, I think some of my favorite moments with you were when you were intoxicated. Um, I wouldn't change a thing about you, buddy. I would just keep being you. It's good. I like to. I like to hear that. And just be you, not in downtown Detroit. That's all. Yeah, you know, tone down the racism, but keep being you. <laughs> look, I, I'm definitely not racist. That's a bad time. I point that there, but, um, yeah, no, look, I the things the things that we think of this the state siders, you know, it's. The, the, the crazy, you know, there's some over here that are still, you know, the Animal Justice Party is, is the newest thing. And um, the Australian public don't quite grasp the idea of PETA yet. Um, and we've started to see that legislation sort of start to creep its way in for consideration because we'll get a politician that's aligned themselves to PETA because it's easy, it's easy votes. It's let's grab that, the heartstrings of people and, you know, look at this yeah. slaughterhouse and look at this, Petco over the states where they have animals dying in tubs, you know, that that sort of legislative, those sort of sorts of legislative, legislative pieces have started to sort of creep into politicians' agendas just because they're easy votes and they get them elected. Um, so look, I, I I really don't like seeing the, the likes of Tiger King. Like it's interesting, I get it, but I also want people to understand that having animals and treating them correctly is not only the human thing to do, but it's also a right itself. And I, the more you abuse that right, the more likely it is you're going to have things slapped down on you. And, and rightly so. You know, he, he's got, again, I've only got the Netflix documentary to really um, underpin my knowledge, but, you know, to have that many animals and just be breeding them and breeding them and breeding them and know that they only have an infinite lifespan with the general punter. Um, to me, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. You know, to to breed a litter once a year and have a litter of tiger cubs because you love the experience of breeding them and knowing that there there might only be two, three, four in that litter and finding two, three, four home every year would be responsible. But breeding 10, 15, 20, 30, and again, you don't really get a, a really good grasp for the numbers, but the the notion that he was just mass producing them to sell is there. Um, you know, I don't think that's the right way to retain your rights, you know, especially when you're looking at an animal that has a very limited um, limited opportunity to be on sold to the responsible punter. Um, so, you know, for the likes of Carol Baskin, do I think she killed her husband and fed it to a tiger? Damn fucking right I do. But um, <laughs> do I think that she has the mentality the correct mentality that she's promoting that maybe these types of animals shouldn't be mass produced. I kind of agree with her on that front. Um, do I think they should be taken away from everyone's ability to keep these things? Not at all. Not at all. You know, the, the world's, the world's animals would be in a much better position if the legislative pieces around restriction were removed completely. And those that were doing the wrong thing were policed correctly. You know, that you wouldn't have half a continent, chasing every animal based on the Western world's needs because it's a poaching, a poaching opportunity if there was free trade with everybody, you know? Yep. You wouldn't have the smuggling rings we have in Australia that seem to pop up periodically if there was free trade and it was licensed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things, things, you know, much to our detriment, we might find that our whole uh, ability to... Um, you know, make a little little side cash to cover your hobby or cover the next purchase, maybe limited as a result of that opening up. But I would much rather live in a world where I'm free to do what I want because I know my, my morals will keep me in line than have my whole hobby jeopardised because one idiot found a loophole within a system and made millions and then got caught. So... Uh -huh. 
Um, I do agree. Um, you know, honestly, we have too many freedoms when it comes to a lot of animal stuff. Um, and you're right. It's, um, you know, we're America. We want it more. We want it bigger. We want to keep going. It's not enough to make one. You got to make 20. Um, and, you know, some of the laws that are put in place are definitely not in favor of the animals. And, you know, I actually really appreciate how your country has some restrictions. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't realize how crazy your restrictions were, but, mm -hmm. you know, having a license, you know, proving you're responsible enough to actually work with something and not just say, OK, cool. All I have to do is go to the local show. Let's say the Hamburg, Pennsylvania show and buy an alligator or a puff adder or something on someone's stable. You have no business buying, but you're 18 years old and it's OK. But, you know, at the same time, you have that issue there. And, you know, like you said, protecting animals, um, you know, that is one thing, you know, um, you know, that Donald Trump has actually done is, you know, the penalties for abusing animals have actually gone up a little bit. Um, so, you know, that is a positive. So, I don't know, like I said, anything with animals or anything when you're working with anything live is probably such a tough topic um, because, you know, you can't really please everybody. No. Um, and at the end of the day, you really got to look at yourself in the mirror. And, you know, some people can look at themselves in the mirror no matter what, where other people, it eats away at them. Um, not everybody should be an animal breeder. But, um, you know, like I said, you guys are forced to be a little more responsible where we are semi forced to be responsible. Like you said, when our big chain pet stores have animals that are dehydrated and dying in the containers for hundreds of people to see every day, um, you know, it really puts a, I mean, it, it gives the whole hobby a bad look. So of course. And we're, we're lucky enough that we don't really, we do have big chains, but we don't really have pets being sold apart from aquarium fish um, in droves. Um, but there's, there's that, there's two mentalities to take this round. It's, you know, there's the, the animal cruelty route, but then there's also doing the animal kindness as well. So, you know, you get the animal nuts that are at the, the complete pinnacle of crazy that think, you know, putting an animal down because it's got, you know, a brain tumor and it's, it's like kinked like this is the worst thing that anyone could possibly do. But for us, we know that sometimes that's, that's a kindness. Um, you know, we, we see we see disparity between those two two realms here. But the, the, the thing that I will bring up, just because we're regulated, it's not to say that we don't still get the crazies. We don't still get those that push the rules or, you know, um, cause drama mm. as a result of not keeping animals correctly and then being caught. You know, there's, there's animal abuse cases left, right and centre. You know, there was a, recently a, a zoo owner, a dog happened to... Um, I think this was promoted over the last couple of days. A, a, a bull terrier or something had, you know, gotten out of someone's yard. It obviously not been, you know, trained the way it should have, and then attacked this guy's camel at a at a uh, zoo. Somehow got into the zoo complex and attacked the camel, and he tortured that poor dog. You know, that, as far as I'm concerned, I've got four had four dogs recently, and I'm down, down, down to three, but I've got dogs myself and, and they are very much unique and the way you train them is the way they come out mm -hmm. most of the time. Uh, and a bull terrier is bred for, a, bred for one particular thing, you know, not trained properly, it's not right. But this particular person took it upon himself to torture this poor dog for um, hours and hours, you know, um, pitchforked it and done all sorts of nasty things to it. And, and you know, that we still have those scumbags here and that we're heavily re regulated to that sort of thing. And, we still have those people that still take it upon themselves to do stupid shit like that. So um, it's, I don't think rules breeds responsibilities. I don't think regulations breed responsibilities. I think morals breed internal mm -hmm. responsibilities. Um, and, you know, I think just more people need to realize that what we have is, it's not our right to have them, even though it technically is, it's still, you know, it's still a blessing to be able to work with these day in, day out. We should be responsible and make sure that we're looking after the system. But, you know, don't let it, you know, bend us over and, um, and put us into a position where we're having our liberties taken away from us over nothing. You know, there's, I think there's, there's been a couple of cases in the States that I look at. I'm just like, shit, that's definitely going to be a clamp down. Like you guys are, are on the cusp of a, a clamp down after that and then nothing happens. You know, you might have a state rule change. Um, whereas if that happened over here, it would be used as a, a benchmark to bring in a massive sweep of changes. Um, you know, I'm not sure if Victoria is really a good one to point out, but when all of this, the green tree python thing hit a, hit a, um, it's, it's height. We have had New South Wales and I think Queensland now will not allow you to breed anything that was a red neonate from original. 
anything that's not an Aussie green wow. tree python is now basically now having to live its life out until its end. Uh, Victoria, I don't think, has gone down that route, uh, which is smart because I think the horse has already bolted. Everyone's just going to breed. It's going to drive everything underground. But I think those rules have come through as a result of, you know, those smugglers bringing in green tree pythons. You know, so cause and effect there. So... Um, I hate to do this. Now, I'm going to semi say my goodbye right now because my battery life is at like 3%. Um, wow. It doesn't have to mean this is over, but just in case you guys lose me, I am very sorry. Way to <laughs> but, go, um, dude. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. it's. Uh, it, I could have brought a charger. I didn't bring a charger. What was I thinking? Um, <laughs> but, um, well, I mean, me personally, and this is just in case I have to leave, um, you know, first off, I just want to say that I hope your government doesn't watch this and come bang down your door and put a bag over your head and drag you out. <laughs> Um, that'd be really really? tragic. And, um, you know, you have a second generation breeder you're raising over there, or at least hopefully a second generation. And, um, if I were you, I'd probably put them into politics, man, you know, raise them, right. Get them doing the right things. And you go ahead and try to your contribution to your community could be your son going into your government and actually trying to do things to benefit everybody. Good luck with that. But let's hope (laughs) no pressure. No oh, pressure. No pressure. <laughs> my son, so I'm not sure whether he's just going to drown himself with vodka or uh, actually do something productive. But um, he's Wait, already. That's not the same thing. Well, in my case, I'm more productive when I've had vodka. <laughs> <ask Dave>. um, <laughs> I'm way better at interviews when I'm out. No, yeah, never. I've uh, I visited every room in Tinley, uh, every hotel room in Tinley after I had a bottle. So Dave is was my chaperone. Um, my man. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Held your hand when I could. Yep. Uh, yep. I'm pretty sure there's a generation of couple of babies I don't know about, but um, uh, with, <laughs> with the albino, when that lizard was the only lizard that I was raising, I obviously had my son here and I was doing everything I should have done, but um, to keep the animals alive. And he, his first word was literally izzard. You know, he's, nice. he, I can't go a morning without him pointing to the back door and just saying izzard and wants to come out and actually see the animals. Um, the other day I had one of the animals that is quite tub defensive. It's a, a young one that I'm raising for someone else. And I check them in the morning. I give them some water. They're actually in a rack because that's how I raise babies up until a certain point in a rack and I sun them occasionally. Um, and he put his finger in there whilst I had my head turned. And this lizard, I don't know whether I grabbed him. I couldn't find any marks on his hand, but he let out this little squealy shout and then pissed himself laughing. <laughs> and this lizard had its mouth open, like full blue tongue, mouth open, tongue out. And I hadn't seen that reaction. So he's obviously done something to elicit it. And he was dead set that he wanted to put his finger in there again. I'm like, dude, if you want to do this, it's on you. It's going to be a learning curve. <laughs> his, mom's in the other, his mom's in the other room. Going, Don't you do this. And I'm like, I can't hear you. He wants to do it. He needs to learn. And I don't know. This kid's like 14 months old. And he grabbed this lizard in a way that I would usually grab a defensive lizard. And he just picked it up and he looked at it and he went, nah. And I'm like, what do you, what? And then Lizzie just calmed down and he put it back in the tub. So uh, I'm in for some trouble when that kid's old enough to walk. <laughs> I'm in for, in for some trouble when that kid starts talking because this room probably isn't big enough for both of us. You know, it's a 12 metre by 12 metre room and there's probably another room, enough room for another six racks. I don't think it's going to be enough if he kicks off in the same fashion I did. You know, I'm, I can see some sacrifices coming, coming my way. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Before, before Dave gets off. Um, all right. So one thing that all Americans want to know, you don't have to tell us about your favorite, just about the most recent uh, fight that you had with a kangaroo. Cause yeah. we yeah. think that all Australians just fight kangaroos and yeah. wrestle saltwaters. And- all I can say is if the, if you want to fight the local, um, Elderly kangaroo, I'd call it, because he's an absolute beefcake. Man, good luck to you. I don't even think um, I don't even think you guys deshirted and oiled up could probably handle him. He's, he's um, I've walked out and let's call it one o'clock in the morning because I've heard a noise or something, or the dogs have gone off, and I've been pretty much face to not wouldn't say face to face, but he's been within a couple of meters of me, and he's been out in the dark, and I've switched the lights on, and he's just kind of gone. Oh, lights are on. Who's this? And he's postured up and I've backed up real quick. So <laughs> these guys, I think there was a, a viral video that went around a couple of years back where a guy's dog was being attacked by a kangaroo and he gave yeah. him a good sock in the side of the face. All I can say is that guy would have had a 
a nice pile in his pants when he did that because <laughs> these these animals yeah okay your dog's getting hurt i'd probably do the same thing i'd run in to try and try and split it up these animals are pure muscle they're pure muscle and scratch they look like so, it they are ripped yeah yeah you get a male that's that's on task and thinks you're a, an issue those legs like they bound over three meter fence, fences you know it's those legs are just Holy nothing but muscle and they, they type the tails but the base of the tails are like this thick and again pure muscle they prop themselves up with their tails it's there's enough force there to do some damage so you know I try and feed the local kangaroos where possible with some sweet potato and stuff just to be on their right side. Um, yeah. My dogs are very wary. They won't go anywhere near the kangaroos. If they hear a noise, they'll bounce. But, you know, that they, they've got a healthy respect for them. Honestly, put me in a ring with one, I'd probably jump out of it pretty quick. <laughs> See, the kangaroos actually run Australia. You guys are just allowed to live there. <laughs> uh, up until recently, we've actually got an issue where they're overpopulated. So... Um, Pretty soon you're no, not even going to be allowed to live there. That's crazy. <laughs> no, they don't run Australia because at the moment they're being culled in number. Um, they breed like crazy. Like I've, there's a particular female that I watch here. She had a joey in her pouch, an advanced joey in her pouch up until I think about a week ago. And now that's at her foot. And I seen her mating the other day. You know, it's just bang, 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 one after the other. And um, yeah, they, they clean up cars. You know, you'll be driving, there'd be no sense for why this animal would jump out in the middle of the road. And all of a sudden you've got six kangaroos bounding in front of you while you're doing 110 k's an hour. So in the pitch black, you know, so it's, they're, they're not fun. So <laughs> guys in the States, take it out of your head. Don't wrestle them. Don't, don't think it's a All we have are squirrels, man. I don't know. Deer. You know deer. Like we have deer. That's I true. I love squirrels. We squirrels eat deer. Bomb. I don't know. They eat kangaroo. Do you eat kangaroo? I eat deer. Deer aren't the ones. Squirrels, they're the ones. Kangaroos are really tough meat. So um, it's a bit of a, it's a weird situation over here. We, we don't really take, or most of us don't take umbrage to um, eating kangaroo, emu. Uh, it's not something that happens regularly. It's kind of more of a niche meat. Um, you know, it's, it's quite a delicacy for some, some restaurants and stuff. But, you know, crocodile seems to have made it to the tables as well. Um, mm. But when I was when I was over in the states, I was in Florida, and we went to um, a particular uh, waterside restaurant that was like an old gumbo type type situation. And they've, yep. um, we've all been there. They've come across, and I thought I'd do the right thing after five days of bendering myself. Um, and I tried alligator, and I don't know why I did it because it's kind of against my ruling. But I gave that a crack, and I'm just like. I don't understand how anyone eats this. And Swing I and a miss, it. right? You know. Well, you had it. Like you had it. it deep fried, right? Yeah, deep fried. It it's the like worst way to actually have it. It's disgusting. Okay. It's not disgusting, but when you deep fry something, it tastes like everything else. That could have been a mushroom in there, for all you know. Yeah. yeah. It, it was like eating dirt. It was this dirty riverine taste that you would get out of um, freshwater fish as well. Yeah, you went to the wrong Bubba Gumps. I'm, I'm yeah, a good, who I'm took a good you guy. there? Yeah. Nasty. Was who thought was this? It was after after visiting the St. Augustine uh, croc farm too and getting the back back scene. So I was like, <laughs> fuck it, I'm going to eat one of those fuckers. <laughs> but um, I regretted the decision pretty quick. And I think kangaroo over here, if you get the chance to eat it, it's unless it's marinated and tenderized for like half its lifetime, um, it's quite tough and not a tasty meat by any means. And emu is just like, Big gamey chicken. So. I just don't understand it because you guys eat Vegemite. What the heck? Have you actually just, you know, you've got to get a Vegemite. <laughs> I've had it. A level of application. You can't just go in there as a novice and smash <laughs> Vegemite like it's Nutella. So put it on. My, my, yeah, if you, if you get your chance to, to give Vegemite a crack, here's my expert um, advice for you buttered to heavily buttered toast. Yeah, thin, okay. Thinly. Thinly applied Vegemite. Don't slather it on like it's Nutella. Okay. And grab, mash up some avocado and throw it over the top. Trust me. See? Bomb bomb combo. So uh, essentially what you're saying is put as many things on it as possible so you can't taste it? <laughs> no, because you still need that slight zing of Vegemite underneath of it. So. You're getting a small hint of Vegemite. Like there's just a little bit on the toast, but it's pretty much avocado and butter. This you're is what I'll do for you. you like a whole tube of Vegemite. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just – it's true. a season. Who applies it in a tube? I don't know. That's the that's the, 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 the I'm from America. Job. I don't know where you're 
You show that video? Who could ever go through a whole glass jar of it? It's not like a tube of toothpaste. You just squeeze it off. No, no, no. Well, you could, but then your application's all stuffed up. So, um, there you go. <laughs> because the science behind Vegemite application, guys, you can't just smear it on and hope for the best. So, when you were in America, get, did you go to Walmart and get a can of spam? No, because we've actually got that there. We're not stupid. We know not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one thing that I would do miss from, um, from the States, and I've been told that I don't understand how you guys eat this, is. Um, What's a Mexican place? Taco Bell. So yeah. <laughs> at every airport that we went through, because I'd either be so I'm painting myself a really bad picture as being a drunk, but um, <laughs> you're I'm on vacation. Not. Fine. Um, I think after Tinley, we went from Tinley down to Florida, but um, every airport with the only real thing that was there for us to munch, and because I'd had very minimal sleep, was there was always a Taco Bell. There was very limited KFC, which is odd because they're everywhere here. And it was very limited McDonald's, which again, McDonald's is everywhere here. It's like on every corner. So yeah. um, Taco Bell was my staple. And every time I ate it, if we had an American chaperone with us, they're like, you are going to be on the toilet. You're going to be sick as a dog. <laughs> Those and, poor plane seats, really. The seat cushions got to be. The upholstery person that cleaned your seat had to pass out. I was solid. I was absolutely <laughs> solid as a rock the whole time. He's right. He did a crap for like three weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, did, I, did. I remember that the only thing that really sort of got me, and oh, Dave's gone. Yeah, um, I think so. The only thing that really got me when I was over there is um, I think your president of the US ARC, is his name Phil? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Phil, after the banana bar, I think it was like 3 a.m., and the, the bar person was telling me that I drank them dry of Grey Goose and um, <laughs> using the C bomb to describe someone is uh, apparently friend of mine. Yeah. You can't use it as a term of endearment. Yeah, we don't, we're not in on that yet. I get yeah, it. No, it's it's like staying yeah. high over there, but over here it's pretty offensive still. Yeah, well, I think um, Jason Balin was there when I called the bartender. I, um, I said, uh, what did I say? I'm like, can you pour me another drink? She goes, no, sir, you're cut off. You're, you're very, very drunk. And I'm like, I can still stand. I'm not slurring my words. And Jason's pissing himself behind me. And, um, I've just gone, don't be a cunt, just pour me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> that and went over I, great. I had, I had a smile on my face when I delivered it. I said it in a jovial manner, and she's looked at me. She goes, right, you are definitely not getting another drink. And oh. everyone in the bar has just kind of, it was like that time pause. Everyone stopped. <laughs> and I just looked at everyone, and I've gone, hmm. Maybe I've made a mistake here. <laughs> Can I get one last triple, please? One last, because you've drank us dry of Grey Goose. There is literally no Grey Goose behind you. I'm like, I'll have a couple of shots then. She's like, no, you've called me a cunt. I'm like, but with all due respect, I called my mum a cunt. Um, <laughs> and that was the tipping point. I think Phil was in the room as well. They were like, lights were on, everyone was leaving. And as I've walked out, he's gone, do you need a burger? And I'm like, <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. Maybe I need to eat something yeah. <laughs> before I make a fool of myself. And he actually did a 3 a.m. Wendy's run to get burgers for me. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even know Wendy's was open at 3 a.m., but apparently it is. And It's America. That burger, that <laughs> Wendy's burger, left Wendy's me in a smaller. sorry state. I was, I, maybe it was the alcohol, maybe it was the Wendy's burger. But um, no, it, um, that that particular one was the only thing that upset my stomach while I was over there. But um, oh. I, 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 some, I somehow navigated your grease and, and oversized portions quite well whilst I was over there. <laughs> yeah, that's when I, we've met some other people that Peter Birch uh, brings over, and um, we're always like, oh, okay, let's go try. And they're like, yeah, we want to try some of this greasy food. But then after they eat it, they're like, oh, I just feel terrible. Our food is processed, most of it. So it always yeah. feels heavier. Even if it's like not that bad, it still feels heavier than food outside of the country. It's just crazy. Portion sizes was the thing that really pinned it for me. It's like, yeah, I can't get through that. And for me not to get through it, like I'm, I'm not fast by any means. I'm probably a, a really slim. I was actually really fit back then too. So I was an absolute animal with food. But if I can't get through a plate of food when I'm going to the gym twice a day, it wasn't then, but I'd been partying, so maybe needed, needed the intake. But um, if I couldn't get through a plate of food, it was kind of – it was shocking to me. It was like, food's there, I'll eat it. And I just couldn't – there was just absolutely no chance. So it's – I it's, uh, I visited uh, South Africa, and I can I can eat kind of a lot here. 
and um, obviously, and uh, <laughs> in South Africa, I was eating, and I'm like, after the first few days, my body started to adjust, and I could eat like a lot of food there, and it wasn't big portions, you know, but I could eat a lot of food, and I felt fine, and I was actually eating more in South Africa, and I was losing weight. Yeah, and I was like, like 500 yeah. degrees. Oh well, yeah, that too. But uh, <laughs> then, but then I get back, and I couldn't finish like a small portion for my regular meal here. Like it took me a long time to kind of readjust. We it's are just super the food and calories here. We are dense in calories. Yeah. Most likely. But over here, you know, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the same with you over there. Fresh food is so damn expensive. Like it's yeah. becoming, we're, we're starting to go that way of processed food being um, cheaper on all, all avenues and, and mm -hmm. good healthy food being more expensive. So I know for, for a long time I've seen, because I've obviously added everyone that I've met over there over the years, and for a long time I've seen a couple of posts come up where, you know, your fresh food is so absorbently priced that yeah. it kind of pushes most people out of the bracket to be able to eat healthy. Yep. You can get the dollar cheeseburger, but an $8 salad. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whereas yep. just, just to give you some, some insight, our cheeseburgers might be $2 on a promotional period for an hour once a month, you know, so, yeah. you know, usually it's about three bucks and even McDonald's meals have kind of gone up to the, the $15 mark for, for a large meal. And, they're wow. relatively small in comparison to your portions, and, and that's comparing fast food, you know. So, um, trying to feed a family <laughs> on, yeah. uh, on uh, you know wage these days, and our, our cost of living is absolutely exorbitant again in comparison to yours. You know, electricity yep. bills once once a month are probably about three four hundred dollars, um, and then you minus your discount if you've got a pay on time discount, all that sort of stuff. And and again, that, that probably plays into the scale of our operations over here as well, our market and our living cost of living. You know, I've got nine, uh, 18 cages behind me and it might sort of double in the next couple of years as projects sort of kick off. But even that, that's kind of the limit of where I'll be. And even that, that'll be you know, me stretching out to pay for, for electricity bills and stuff. So um, wow. you know, a lot of people don't realize that when they get into the hobby here. It's, you know, you, just by buying an animal does not necessarily mean you can go out and buy 10, 15 of these animals because you get excited about it. But just remember, you've then got the on flow costs and responsibility of keeping it so it's, a, it's another sure. i think it's standard catch across the seas for for new hobbyists too you know, yeah go and buy 500 animals and then six months later go Oof. Well, that, yeah <laughs> to feed these the things are ridiculous yeah. yeah i want it is there i don't know what uh system you're on are you on a phone or a, a, a laptop or something or desktop? A laptop. okay is there is there any way you can get kind of close to one of your cages or maybe Send me a picture of one of your cages. I just want to see your setup, your blue tongue setup, because we keep things obviously a little bit differently. But um, you know, we're staring at this and we're like, "Oh man, it'd be cool." I kept thinking it'd be cool to see. I could jump in a cam bot. Some cam bot. Okay. So I keep it relatively minimalistic um, for multiple reasons. Mostly because when you've got multiple animals, you try and keep things streamlined. So last year I had bricks, so I'd use um, ceramic bricks. So I'd have, um, sorry, not ceramic, um, stone bricks. I'd have yep. one big brick and then one longer brick over the top, uh, which was fine for animals that weren't really able to move those bricks. Um, and then what I'd find every so often if I was in the room doing something, I'd hear a brick click and I'm like, oh, that's, that's a problem waiting to happen, you know, if an animal gets caught under those two layers of bricks. So what I went and done is I um, grabbed some form ply and I made, you know, just a, a really, really simplistic hide. Mm -hmm. uh, I used some pine pine shavings here because it's good for, for cleanliness. Um, you know, that absor mm -hmm. absorbs immediate smell. Uh, and I change this stuff probably every th three to four months, depending on you know, cleanliness and timing. Uh, for me personally, I generally try and clean these just before clean these out just before I, they go into hibernation uh, for a period of time, and then after they're finished breeding, because they make a fair bit of mess. You know, if, uh, skittish females or anything similar might, might defecate in the cages um, as a, a male approaches them if they're not ready, or you know, just just the general idea. You know, if you've shagged in a bed, you probably want to clean it the next day. <laughs> right. Um, I do that. I clean out the shavings. Then uh, water water gets changed every couple of days. Um, and then their feeding doesn't actually happen 
because of my anti issue that I've got here, feeding doesn't necessarily happen in the cage. You know, if I've got something that I know will smash food in front of me, um, I'll put the animal on top, I'll put the, the ball of food in front, and I'll make sure it's eaten before I walk away. A bit time consuming, but at least then I know exactly how much has actually been eaten. And, um, and what's the, uh, the tube there? Is that a light that shines directly onto that, the hide? What's yeah, the, so the foam? Is, give me, if you give me two seconds, I'll grab the box out for the, the applications that I use. Um, okay. I use um, complete, I actually use the Arcadia lighting system for the cages. So with the UV, there's actually a um, Pro T5 Fitty, which you can just see the tip of just in there. And yeah, it's angled. Cool. It's angled yeah. um, down onto the actual cage. So um, that's what we to, have. Yeah. yeah. So look, um, the reason we use those is there was no other daisy chainable uh, product available mm -hmm. at the time. So for me, when I go out and I research these setups, I want to make sure that it's it's just neat and streamlined. There's no point having cords everywhere. There's no point having um, you know differences in in your setup. I just much rather make everything the same. Um, I've got those daisy chained across each bank act separately. So I've got a bank of nine and nine. Uh, and then the heat source is actually the new Arcadia deep heat emitter. So I've got the 50, 50 watts on the mm. um, top and middle. And then the bottom ones have the 80 watts just for the, the floor, um, the cold coming off the floor. So at least that way they've got a higher wattage. And that points right onto that hide? Yeah, certainly. So directly under that dome, so that dome hides just usual um, metal dome type light with that that um, heat emitter in it, and underneath that dome is probably around forty to forty two degrees in the hot spot with the elevation. Wow. Wow. And yeah, we and I I wanted to ask more one hundred and one questions, but <laughs> um, how quickly? Like, what's your uh, what's your process for warming them up? Like, how do you warm them up? And then when do you start introducing? And I know you said it's kind of based on the, the how they act, but. Yep, so um, for me personally, over the last couple of years of breeding, um, I've used the switch off mentality really with a couple of hours heat. Um, what I do is I just basically walk into the room and I slowly bring the heat back up to their normal temps, um, which will be over say three or four days. Um, I don't really transition it much less than that because I want to make sure the animals are, me personally, I'd like to make sure the animals are heated up as quickly as possible. Because once that happens, I guess you've got a basically um, a period of time for the window, you know, for the window of, of these animals being receptive to actually take on and be successful. So last year I absolutely failed with that. I'm not going not gonna to even hide that. I uh, absolutely failed with getting the, the males up to, to be heated up quick enough because the ambience weren't there. So um, you go from brumation, like how cold it is, you turn everything on and you're heated up from like it's down in the the 18 20 degree range something like that um and you heat it up to 42 in five days five or six days pretty fast we're like waiting like drawing that period of time out at least a month really yeah that's what that's what people tell us and to people, do people are here because like i said we had a lot of people here that are trying to breed especially easterns um are having a very hard time with production and they're saying oh slowly bring them up don't bring them up to maximum temperature until they're already paired because you're killing off the sperm because they i guess they've tried to heat them up too fast and they've and they've you know not been successful look it could, could very well be the case you know what works again what works for me may not necessarily work for others and you know, if you've got pure Easterns versus pure Northerns, there's two very separate processes there. There's some people yep. in, in Australia that don't even call their Northerns. You know, it's the, the natural ambient changes are enough to, to kick them into cycle. Um, whereas Easterns, I know Easterns and watch blue tongues, they probably need a much colder winter to, to kick that into place to get viable sperm. But, you know, just because I turned the hotspot up doesn't necessarily mean the animal's active. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it takes the animal a couple of weeks to snap out of the grog and, um, really get into normal rhythm and it may take the animal another couple of weeks before it actually starts to do what it needs to do. But, you know, again, I've only got two, two maybe three years worth, or actually two seasons worth of breeding these things to, to really go by. And last season wasn't exactly the most successful. So, um, Right. But you, you hear a lot and you, you learned a lot. I mean, obviously from all the people around you. So, um, 
Look, those questions, we're still, we still kind of, I'm, I'm lucky that I've got Joe as a resource because I'm able to bounce mm -hmm. things off him. But, you know, we've still got people that are quite cagey about what they do. Uh, we've got some disparity between um, what people do in New South Wales versus what people do in Victoria. Um, the geographic differences are huge. Um, not everyone has the ability to have an electronically controlled brew like I do. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, what I do is not necessarily what, what the masses do, but, um, you know, most people personally in New South Wales will generally go quicker. For some reason, I don't know what it is, but anyone in New South Wales seems to get babies out quicker than most. Um, I know Joe kind of goes the, the routes of the, the seasons. So, you know, the Junes, July, August, and then brings them out in, you know, that's personally what I do. I bring them out in the start of September. Um, but it all comes down to ambience. You know, if the lizards are not stupid. If the ambient temperature is down, but you're, you're cranking your heat spot, they, they're going to go with ambient. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. But again, it, you just got to apply the apply the motions. You know, focus on the the process over the result. I think that's the the key takeout for anyone. You know, last year I really just went into autopilot. It was a bit time poor. Didn't really think about the the process and just. Did what I always did and didn't really take into account the outside effects, and and that's essentially been translated into a result. Whereas this year, I'm really focusing on uh, ambience and temps and timings and process. And I know for a fact this room is now in line with what I what I'm used to in regards to heating and control. So um, you know, just focus on what works for you. you. Know if you get a result that year, make sure you're record keeping, make sure you're understanding what you've done differently, because there's nothing worse them walking into a successful year after years and years and years of failure and actually making changes, but not knowing which change actually kicked off or was the catalyst for success. Right. So, you know, piss poor, I think they say piss poor uh, preparation, or something like that. Planning, lines. yeah. Yeah, piss poor planning makes for piss poor results. So, you know, or prior preparation. Prevents piss poor. Uh, prevents piss poor. Yeah, there we go. Right. Been a while since I had to use that one during a presentation. So, um, but yeah, look, I, I really think if people just focus on what they need to do to keep that animal happy and, and the process to lead into it rather than being, you know, very slap happy and, and, you know, it's okay, I've always done it like this, so I'm not going to change. Always be open to change and always focus on the process. The outcome gotcha. will come as a result. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I mean, it's been a, a pretty long uh, interview here and I want to, Super informative too. Yeah, it was I was really interested in pretty much everything you're saying. I'm just like, we, I probably we could probably talk more about lots of things, but no, if, you um, need, if you ever need another chat, by all means. But the, the, the caveat I will put on this on all of this information is that you know, yes, I've been doing Australian reptiles since I was 12. Um, I'm by no means an expert. I still learn every single day. I still have to ask questions of people, um, mm -hmm. and this realistically for the skinks is you know, third, fourth year keeping and only second year breeding. So, you know, the things that I tell you now could be superseded by something different next year. Gotcha. Right. On. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and um, we're glad that we had you on and I'll let you know when this, this goes live, it'll probably go live next Saturday. Um, and uh, which I guess for all the listeners, this just went live, <laughs> from, <laughs> but uh so we really appreciate you having me on and uh, we'll put your link in the description below uh, of, with all your stuff. So do you want to take us out? No, you can do it. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> we didn't. All right. <laughs> so the usual outro. I'll do it for you. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Do, do oh, the outro. I love you. Do the outro. <sighs> what do you usually say? Uh, Ryan usually says a catchphrase, so you have to make up one on the spot. <sighs> Just kidding. Can we just, can we just use all fuck? No. Um, <laughs> yeah. no. Uh, Thanks guys. You've uh, tuned into r and Reptiles uh, Aussie Woo. special. Uh, yeah. And we'll catch you next week. Sounds great. Like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> like, subscribe, or I'll send a kangaroo after. Yeah. Whoa. There you go. There it is. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thanks, man.